Good morning, everyone. We are starting our second day of webinar of Zebrafish. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm Monica, and I'm a professor from University for Federal of Federal University of, of Jataí. And today we are starting with the lecture of Dr. Kister, Kirsten Sandler at Depley. She is a geneticist and cell biologist who has pioneered the use of zebrafish as a model to study development, toxicology, disease, and regeneration with a focus on the liver. In addition to her foundational work with zebrafish, her group incorporates other model systems to ask fundamental questions about cellular and genetic processes that govern development and disease. She completed a BA at Mount Holyoke College, a master in medical sciences at Harvard Medical School and a PhD in cell and development biology at Harvard University. She has a postdoctoral fellow with Nancy Hopkins at MIT, where she carried out a forward genetic screen in zebrafish to identify genes essential for liver development. She has served on the faculty of Bophorus University in, in Istanbul, Turkey, Turkey, and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, where she built a productive lab, successfully competed for funding from the NIH and multiple private foundations. She moved to New York University from uh, Abu Dhabi in 2015 as a Turner Global Network Associate Professor of Biology and was promoted to full professor in 2019. At NYUAD, she teaches undergraduates in biology and leads an active and diverse research group. In addition to function as group leader for her lab at NYUAD, during the summer, she is, in a, she is an investigator at the Marine Biological Laboratories in Woods Wool, MA. She is a passionate advocate for diversity, equity, equity and inclusion in higher education and has worked for decades on advancing gender equity in STEAM. In 2018, she was appointed the vice provost for faculty development and diversity, and in 2021, was appointed as the vice provost for faculty development and engagement, where she leads university efforts in faculty success leadership, development, and investment. She and her husband have four children and live in Abu Dhabi. Thank you, Dr. Kister, and I'm going to, and I hope you have a great lecture. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm going to share my screen now, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, I am going to share my full screen. Please let me know if you can see it. Yes? Can you see my screen? Let me see. Yes, you can, see, full, you can yes. see my full screen? Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so pleased to be able to be here in this webinar. Um, I want to congratulate the organizers for putting together a really impressive um, lineup of speakers, and I'm honored to be included. So today I'm going to tell you um, largely an unpublished story and work in my lab um, focused on senescence and immune surveillance in a zebrafish model of liver cancer. So our lab and many others have been interested in the question of um, how tumor suppressive mechanisms work and um, how they, be, they are bypassed, addressing the question of if tumor suppressive mechanisms can prevent the expansion of damaged cells, how do cancers form? And I refer to this um, now somewhat in old um, picture, but it's still quite relevant, of how a, a cell can go undergo a proliferative or an oncogenic um, stimulus, and most of the time that leads to the activation of apoptosis or senescence, um, and the senescent or benign tumors can attract, attract the immune system 
system, which surveils those cells and eliminates them. However, there is a process by which senescence can be escaped and this tumor suppressive mechanisms fail. And this goes, um, these damaged cells then go on to form a malignant tumor. So this uh, has obvious clinical relevance and we're really interested in understanding the fundamental biology of this um, senescence induction and escape. Uh, and if you look at a human tumor, you can see all of these tumor suppressive mechanisms at play. You can see immune cells infiltrating, uh, cells dying, and senescent cells. And so it really is a fundamental question in the cancer biology field of how these productive, um, this is a hepatocellular carcinoma, how this hepatocellular carcinoma can form even though these tumor suppressive mechanisms have been activated. So um, we study senescence mostly, and the way that we think about it quite simply is the activation of this um, process that is then cleared by the immune system. So there are two steps in senescence um, acting as a tumor suppressive mechanism. One is the withdrawal from the cell cycle, and the second is immunoclearance. And the relevance of um, senescence clearance to cancer has been illustrated by many studies. I'm showing one here on a beautiful paper um, from 2011, where the investigators used mouse and overexpressed the oncogene and RAS. And you can see that there's a sporadic or a mosaic expression of RAS in this model on the left. And then what you can see over time is that these uh, RAS expressing cells are cleared. However, when the, um, when the immune system is impaired, these senescent cells are not cleared and tumors go on to form. So what you see at the bottom is a liver from a um, RAS overexpressing liver, a mouse, um, where the B cells and T cells are knocked out and you can see the arrows pointing to tumors forming. And then another one where they've also knocked out the NK and macrophages. And you can see many, many tumors forming in this model. So the hypothesis here is that these cells expressing RAS underwent um, senescence, but then escaped and were able to go on and form tumors because the immune system was not there to, um, to eliminate them. So senescence is a response to cell damage. There are many, many things that can cause cells to go into senescence, like the oncogene uh, activation that I just mentioned, telomere um, attrition, um, DNA damage is a major one, and we and epigenetic changes as well. And what we see when we look at senescent cells is what's termed a permanent cell cycle arrest, although I think the data from many cancer models, like the one I just showed you, um, negates that activation of a persistent DNA damage response, there's this important secretory phenotype called senescence-associated secretory phenotype in which these senescent cells secrete cytokines and chemokines, beta-galactosidase um, positivity um, is a marker that we use for senescent cells. The, most senescent cells have loss of DNA methylation and you have a dramatic change in the nuclear morphology. So put simplistically, this is how we think of senescence acting as really a roadblock to a damaged cell going on and forming a cancer. But in some cases, the cells are able to get by this, in which case they can escape. Or in another case, the cell might start to go down the senescence path, but then bypasses the senescence, um, the senescence program. And these, um, in either case, the cells are then able, they're damaged cells that then are able to go on and um, uh, acquire malignant phenotypes. Um, we know that the immune system is part of this, and um, my lab is really uh, studying the process by which the um, uh, epigenetic damage leads to senescent cell induction and how the immune system helps clear these cells. That so what I'm going to tell you today is um, four short stories. Um, one is about a gene that we've been studying for a long time called UHRF1, which is an epigenetic regulator, which we found is an oncogene in hepatocellular carcinoma. The second story I'm going to tell you about is how UHRF1 overexpression causes senescence in zebrafish. I'll also tell you about how UHRF1 induced senescence activates an immune response and how this leads to bypass of the senescence program. So um, as a quick reminder of uh, the factors that regulate the epigenome, I'll point out that there are uh, readers writers and erasers of the epigenome that serve to create a complex code in which that governs whether the DNA is wrapped in a tight or closed configuration in heterochromatin or a loose or open configuration in euchromatin. 
And um, this is important because we know that in many, in virtually all cancer cells, as well as in this study showed in precancer or senescent cells, the epigenome is wildly rewritten. And so this is shown here, I think these orange and blue lines show this um, most profoundly. So this is DNA methylation profiling of a precancerous senescent cell. And you can see that since DNA methylation is generally very high in most cells, um, you can see it's the orange um, peaks represent the normal cells. And um, I'm sorry, the blue peaks represent the um, proliferating cells. And then the senescent cells, cells you can see are much lower. So there's this global and broad domains that have lost DNA methylation. And this is a change that happens before these cells become malignant. And I think that's the important point here. So we have been studying a, a protein called UHRF1, which is a multi-domain protein that both works as an epigenetic um, reader as well as a writer. And um, um, the majority of the work on UHRF1 has focused on the SA, SRA domain, which is required for binding hemimethylated DNA and propagating DNA methylation during uh, DNA replication. And I show that to you pictorially here. So in this um, slide, what I show you is that um, UHRF1 comes in and it um, during the replication, when the replication fork passes across um, a DNA, the newly, met, newly um, synthesized strand, the daughter strand, does not contain the methylation marks of the parental strand. And so what UHRF1 does is it binds to components of the histone code, as well as this hemimethylated DNA, and then it recruits in the DNA methyltransferase to propagate and to copy the methylation pattern onto the daughter strand. And this is how all vertebrate cells copy the DNA methylation pattern during DNA replication. So it goes to follow that um, in all systems studied, in, including much of the work from my lab, has shown that loss of UHRF1 or DNMT1 leads to global erasure of the DNA methylome. And, um, and my lab has been studying this in the context of the zebrafish embryo for a number of years. What I'm going to tell you about today is how overexpression of UHRF1 leads to cancer. So what we know is that UHRF1 is overexpressed in many cancer types. So these are um, from the TCGA, colorectal, liver, and prostate cancer, with normal being at zero. So you can see in every tumor in, in this um, cohort, in these cohorts, you have uh, overexpression of UHRF1. And we showed previously that patients that have high UHRF1 expression in their um, hepatocellular carcinoma context have. Um, a lower probability of survival following surgery, as well as a higher probability of recurrence. So a poor um, clinical outcome associated with high UHRF1 levels. Um, UHRF1 is overexpressed in multiple types of cancer. And what you can see, which I think is quite important here, is that UHRF1 overexpression levels are not uniform in the tumors. So here I'm showing you HCC, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. And if you focus on the HCC, you can see some cells that have the brown staining indicating UHRF1, whereas other cells are blue, indicating these are tumor cells that have lost UHRF1. So this is a model of uh, 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 cancer gene overexpression, but it's not ubiquitous. So we're trying to understand how this heterogeneity leads to tumors. And so what we wanted to know is whether or not um, UHRF1 overexpression in this case is a passenger or a driver for HCC. So to do this, um, we generated a model of um, UHRF1 overexpression using zebrafish. And I know that I don't need to convince the audience here because you're all here at a zebrafish webinar that you um, using zebrafish to study cancer has many advantages. Um, what I wanna point out here on this slide is that there's a high histological correlation between the, um, in, between the um, pathology of zebrafish HCC and human HCC, which is here on the left and the zebrafish on the right. We also have the great advantage of doing some imaging in this um, model. And what I'll uh, show you today is how we've taken advantage of this imaging to really understand how these tumors form and how the immune cells interact um, to perhaps promote or um, regulate tumor formation in this model. 
So I want to um, orient the audience to the hepatocyte architecture and introduce some of the tools that we use. So the mammalian liver is um, just like the zebrafish liver is formed of hepatocytes um, and biliary cells. The organization of those cells is different between zebrafish and mammalian livers, but the function of the cells is really the same. And what we have in zebrafish that is really unsurpassed in any other vertebrate model are these beautiful transgenic lines whereby we can label either the um, biliary cells or the hepatocytes with hepatocytes, with, um, cell-specific markers. And we can also use these uh, cell-specific promoters to drive transgenes that have functional properties and study those effects in hepatocytes or biliary cells if we want to. So that's what we did. Um, so several years ago, we generated a transgenic line that overexpresses either a control GFP that's membrane localized in hepatocytes or UHRF1 overexpression um, in hepatocytes. And what we noticed first off was um, very obvious was that there is an, a decreased survival of uh, zebrafish overexpressing UHRF1 in hepatocytes. Um, what we saw was that these um, fish that were maturing past, so these are 20 DPF, um, that they form dysplastic foci and um, hepatocellular carcinoma. All fish by 20 days post-fertilization have some dysplastic changes or some abnormalities, and about 75% of those fish have um, HCC, and this incidence is elevated when, um, and it, uh, when P53, um, one copy of P53 is removed. And in an in vitro model, we showed that um, UHRF1, in a classical um, cell transformation model, we showed that UHRF1 uh, cooperates with RAS to increase colony number in soft agar, and this is really sort of a um, diagnostic test for an oncogene. So this showed us that UHRF1 is an oncogene in HCC. So what I've shown you so far is that UHRF1 um, overexpression um, is required, for, um, leads to hepatocellular carcinoma, that P53 somehow alleviates this, um, or sorry, uh, P53 um, presence um, somehow delays the onset of HCC, and I showed you that um, UHRF1 is an epi oncogene. So um, one of the other phenotypes that we noticed in this um, process was that even though these fish were getting tumors, the livers were quite small. And I'm showing you a little bit of data here um, from a talented undergraduate who um, in my lab who graduated last year, and he this is the same fish over time. So from five, seven, ten. 14 um, and 20 DPF. And what you can see in the controls is that the fish grow and the livers grow. You can see by this green liver here. And uh, what you can see in this particular fish is that um, in, when UHRF1 is overexpressed in the liver, you can both see that the liver gets smaller, the UHRF1, the green gets um, more punctate, and over time, then the liver in this case starts to grow. And so Ian quantified these on many, many, many fish. So what he showed su surprisingly was that between five and seven DPF, in every case here, the liver of each individual fish got smaller. And then an aggregate, um, while the control fish grow over time, the UHRF1 overexpressing lines have a smaller liver at five DPF, and then it stays small with some fish that take off um, as the fish ages. Um, and we thought this was really interesting because it's these, at this growth stage that we start to see tumors, but we were really interested in what happens before these tumors start to grow. So what are the first responses to UHRF1 overexpression? So this is a project that has been taken on in the lab by a very talented postdoc, Elena Magnani, and she um, once uh, addressed the question of how UHRF1 overexpression reduces liver size. So now I bring you back to our original model and um, point out that, so we have UHRF1 overexpressed and she, so she reasoned that we have activation of some tumor suppressive mechanism that leads to um, uh, immune activation and perhaps um, uh, clearance of the tumor cells or the, the senescent cells. So the first thing she did, whoops, sorry. Um, the first thing she did was looked at apoptosis, and indeed she does see that there is some um, moderate increase in cell death in this model, but we reasoned that this cell death was not sufficient to account for the, um, this in, uh, extreme small size of the liver. So she looked at another tumor suppressive 
mechanism, which is senescence. And I'm showing you here the classical model of cell senescence in vitro marked by senescence associated beta galactosidase staining. We've also checked this by cell morphology, gene expression, and a block of proliferation. And what she sees is that there are some fish that have no um, senescence associated beta gal staining in the liver. Some fish have a lot, and some fish have this punctate pattern of senescence associated beta gal. And so we, re we reasoned that there is something about this, um, this pattern that was important for this model. And I'll get into that in a little bit. She next looked at um, another marker of senescence, which is withdrawal from the cell cycle, and she used um, EDU labeling. And what you can see here is that um, as early as three and a half days post-fertilization, which is only about 12 to 18 hours after the transgene comes on, um, cells in the liver have started to decrease their proliferation, and this is very dramatic at four um, DPF. But what was interesting was that we said, well, there is still some proliferation happening there. And so she used the morphology of hepatocytes to, um, to quantify this, the proliferation. So she quantified based on this round nuclear morphology, which is a hepatocyte versus this oblong shape. We, these are not hepatocytes. And what she found was that in the UHRF1 overexpressing cells, you have almost all of the hepatocytes do not proliferate, whereas any proliferation you see is really in the non-hepatocyte population. So this really said to us that hepatocytes overexpressing UHRF1 withdraw from the cell cycle. She also found based on um, uh, based on RNA bulk RNA seq that we have many genes that are um, activated in the DNA repair pathway um, or DNA damage response, which is a signal, another signal of senescence, this sustained DNA damage response, as well as activation of p53. So what I've told you so far is that UHRF1 leads to DNA replication arrest, cellular senescence. And then something happens, um, either escape or bypass, leading to hepatocellular carcinoma. And we know that part of this is regulated by P53. So um, she next team, teamed up with another postdoc in the lab, Filippo Macchi, to ask this question um, about uh, tumor suppressive mechanisms. And if this is activated, how does the cancer form? So is there an escape or bypass of senescence in this model? Um, so I want to remind you of what I told you previously, this, um, that UHRF1 overexpression in tumors is heterogeneous. So I'm showing you here now a zebrafish um, cancer driven by UHRF1. But what you can see is in this tumor, you have some cells that express high levels of UHRF1 and some cells that don't. Um, so even in a transgene model, we have lost UHRF1 expression in some cells, and we believe that it is these cells through histological analysis, these cells without UHRF1, that really have this um, phenotype of being highly malignant. So, um, so Filippo set out to address the heterogeneity in UHRF1 transgenic um, fish uh, using the following approach. He um, crossed um, fish so to another transgene that is expressed in the liver, and this is a nuclear localized um, M cherry. And what you can see here is that all of the hepatocytes label with M cherry. So this is in a wild type fish. And now he looked at this transgene in the context of UHRF1 overexpressing fish. And um, what he found was that um, you have some cells, this is the GFP, you have some cells that express very high levels of UHRF1 and some cells that express, um, all cells express um, the nuclear marker for, um, for hepatocytes, but only some of them express UHRF1. So as early as five days post-fertilization, we already see this heterogeneity in UHRF1 expression, suggesting that some cells have turned off UHRF1 and perhaps these are the cells that go on to proliferate and form tumors. So he looked at this in a really creative way um, by doing um, uh, morphometric analysis and intensity, um, fluorescence intensity analysis, and of um, both cherry, which you see at the top. So um, he looked at the pixel intensity in every cell. So every line here is a cell. And the, uh, what you see in blue is the um, pick the intensity of M cherry in these fish, and you can see it's ranked from high to low. And then he looked at the GFP expression in each of these cells, and that's ranked here. And what you can see is there's really no pattern by which you have um, an accumulation of, um, of UHRF1 overexpression coordinated with M cherry expression. 
So what that said to us is that you have plenty of cells that are hepatocytes. Let's take these ones right here um, that have m chair expression, so they must be hepatocytes, but they do not have UHRF1. So somehow in these cells, UHRF1 has been lost. However, we believe that these cells retain whatever epigenetic damage was um, uh, happened to these cells um, as a result of UHRF1 overexpression. For the interest of time, I don't have to. Um, I don't have the time to show you the data that shows we have um, massive re. Uh, organization of the epigenome in this model. Um, but what we believe is happening is that you have some epigenetic damage that is leading to um, uh, cellular senescence. And then in some of these cells, you're losing UHRF1 expression. Um, and then when UHRF1 is lost, these are the cells that can go ahead and uh, proliferate and undergo senescence escape. So to address this um, more, um, more stringently, Elena undertook um, single cell RNA-seq. And what she, um, I'll show you the, um, this is at 7 DPF, I'll just show you one data set where we look at control animals here on the left. And what you can see is we very nicely identify several hepatocyte clusters, stellate cells, cholangiocytes, endothelial cells, all the cells we expect to see in uh, normal seven-day-old zebrafish larval liver. And when we look at the um, overexpressing lines, and I apologize, the, um, the clusters are not colored the same, um, but what you can see is you have very different populations in different um, in different clusters with several, some unknown clusters. You have infiltration of macrophages here. Um, and the, if you combine these two, um, which I think is easier to look at, the um, the control fish are shown in this sort of pink red color and the UHRF1 overexpressing cells are shown in this green color. You can see that there are some overlap in sig cell signatures, uh, gene expression signatures, but there's a lot of unique um, uh, gene expression signatures in these blue cells here and here and here, and clearly many more macrophages are there. So what um, so what we wanted to do was to sort of use this system to sit to ask how are senescent cells eliminated? We have um, uh, we clearly have activation of immune cells based on that single cell seq. Um, and so Elena went back to look at our RNA seq and found indeed that we have um, so look at these ones in purple. We have lots of upregulation of immune signaling. Um, pathways, including NF kappa B signaling, type 1 interferon signaling. So what we reasoned was that this change in, um, in cell identity was also accompanied by activation of an immune response, and this could be triggered by the senescent cells. So um, uh, Ian has gone on to look at this in more detail using qPCR for two of our favorite genes, um, NF kappa beta and TGF, um, uh, TGF beta. Um, and what you see is that you have this um, big spike in expression um, right at seven days post-fertilization, the same time when we see the cells become very heterogeneous. Um, and so this is supported by this um, uh, by the single cell seq where we see uh, lots of macrophages in the UHRF1 overexpressing line. And so um, what you can see also is that we have, um, as these cells, um, as these uh, livers grow, what we see is that you have a change in cell identity. So for example, we have, in addition to the um, activation of macrophages, we have loss of some of these, um, uh, um, in the controls, we have loss of some cell populations here. Um, and then we have new cell populations that are popping up in um, other clusters. So what this suggests to us is not only do we have infiltration of more in, um, immune cells, but we have new cell identities in these, um, uh, in these um, overexpressing livers, as well as a loss of a cell identity, which is we think is the sort of strong hepatocyte functional markers in uh, UHRF1 overexpressing fish. So I'll show you um, this here um, in a little bit more detail. Um, we're looking at some of the genes involved in the immune response. And what you can see is that this is an interferon response gene. There's lots of this interferon response in these new cell clusters. Um, we can also see activation of a SASP gene. And then of course the macrophages is uh, what we showed you um, previously.
And then finally, um, what we did using the, the power of zebrafish to do imaging, and um, we've done lots of live imaging in this model, I'm just showing you a few examples, is what we, using this, um, this beautiful neutrophil um, tagged line, we show that uh, UHRF1 overexpressing fish uh, have an increase in neutrophil infiltration into the liver. Here are the pictures, but it's um, easier to see when we quantify it here. So Ian counted the number um, of neutrophils in a region of interest. And you can see that this is really elevated in fish at 7, 10, and 14 DPS. So um, this um, all combined shows you that um, we have, when UHRF1 is overexpressed, we have DNA replication arrest, cellular senescence, immune activation in, um, in some of these um, new or so new populations of what we think are hepatocytes, as well as neutrophil infiltration. And then our model is that this um, neutrophil in, or immune activation removes some of the senescent cells, also somehow gets rid of UHRF1 in some, in some hepatocytes, allowing them to escape and form cancer. So um, in the last um, few minutes, I'd like to, to wrap up and really address some of the models that we are working on. Um, and I, um, I wanna put out there that this, this is all a work in progress. What I've shown you today was almost entirely unpublished data. Um, and we are still working on the mechanistic basis of the phenomenon that I showed you today. But what we um, are using as a working model is that when you overexpress UHRF1 in hepatocytes, um, these cells become senescent and um, that they are cleared by the immune system and UHRF1 levels decrease by a mechanism that we don't understand. And so one possibility for, for uh, the tumor formation in this model is that um, the loss of these hepatocytes could activate a progenitor cell that then expands and perhaps somehow those progenitors go on to form tumors. And I, um, another model is that there are some cells that have lower levels of UHRF1 or have lost UHRF1 expression that were previously senescent and now, now they undergo senescent escape and these damaged cells can go on to form tumors. I will tell you, um, I didn't show you the data um, today, but we do not have lots of evidence that supports this first regenerative expansion model. And so our working model is really the one that I explained to you in the bottom, that um, these uh, senescent cells um, reduce future of one and thereby bypass the senescence phenotype. Um, and I want to point out that part of this bypass, I think, is the elimination of some senescent cells by the immune system. Clearly, we have neutrophils infiltrating and macrophages we think are not far behind. So we're investigating that now. So what are um, sort of ongoing questions? Um, uh, so what I showed you is that hepatocytes with high UHRF1 stop proliferating and show some senescent markers. Um, they're cleared by the immune system. And then these immune cells perhaps um, are sources of mitogens that cause the malignant cells to proliferate. Um, but what we don't know is how this epigenetic damage activate the senescence pathway and activate P53. I didn't have time to tell you that we do have um, uh, changes in DNA methylation and loss of major markers of heterochromatin in this model. We don't know what is decreasing UHRF1 levels um, or um, what is perhaps bypassing P53 in this model. And then what are the um, cellular factors that are driving tumor genesis in this model? So with that, I would like to, um, to end. Um, I wanna acknowledge the people that did the work. So um, most of this work was started by a previous graduate student in the lab, Raksha Mudbari. Um, Elena, Elena Magnani um, is the driver on this project and she teamed up um, both in the lab and in life with uh, Filippo Macci to do some of the imaging. Um, some talented undergraduates, Charlene um, Chen and Ian McBain are undertaking um, a lot of this work. And with that, I'd like to um, to end and um, happy to take a few questions. Thank you, Dr. Kirsten Sandler. It was a beautiful presentation. Uh, we are now open to questions uh, and waiting for people from YouTube. Any question, Edis? 
Um, I, I, I have a, a question, maybe it's more um, some doubt. Do you think that those mechanisms that you cite, they are, uh, they are the responsible for the regeneration of the liver either? Or you think this just for tumorogenesis? Um, so that's a really good question. I think that UHRF1 is important in liver regeneration, and we've been studying that in a mouse model, but I think the mechanism is entirely different than what I'm seeing, than what we're seeing in, um, in zebrafish, and that's in part due to the technical reasons of how we manipulate genes in mice versus in zebrafish, but um, I do think that um, part of the response that we're seeing in this model that I showed today is a regenerative response of cells that are um, getting a mitogenic stimulus because of the hepatocyte uh, overexpression of UHRF1 that is sort of um, making them dysfunctional and perhaps, perhaps providing a pro-regenerative or pro-mitogenic environment. Okay, um, any other question? Um, let's just uh, wait a little that maybe yeah. someone is going to to ask something so any questions so thank you Kisten it was okay. a beautiful presentation it's a very thank important you. subject that we have to study and I think that it's going to be a great results that are going to be publicated and they are going to be very important for us as researchers. So thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. And, and congratulations on this beautiful webinar. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. O Instituto de Ciências Biomédicas da Universidade de São Paulo é uma referência nacional e internacional de qualidade no ensino, na pesquisa e nas atividades de cultura e extensão. Fundado em 1969, o ICB está localizado na cidade universitária, em São Paulo, com instalações em oito prédios. Possui ainda uma unidade na cidade de Montenegro, em Rondônia, e um posto avançado em Cruzeiro do Sul, no Acre. 
O ICB está estruturado em sete departamentos, anatomia, biologia celular e do desenvolvimento, farmacologia, fisiologia e biofísica, imunologia, microbiologia e parasitologia, os quais contemplam as principais áreas das ciências biomédicas. Nosso ambiente é multicultural e amplamente democrático. Aqui no ICB valorizamos a conduta ética, respeitamos a diversidade, incentivamos a consciência crítica e capacidade criativa dos nossos alunos, funcionários e professores. Em meio a esse universo multidisciplinar, o ICB completa seus 50 anos com uma excelência consolidada e busca formar cada vez mais profissionais que produzam conhecimento e inovação de modo a contribuir para o desenvolvimento da nossa sociedade. Seja você também parte do nosso Instituto. Saúde. Direito de todos e dever do Estado. Direito à moradia, ao emprego, à educação, a um meio ambiente saudável, à água potável, ao lazer, à cultura. Direito à voz e à paz. Respeito à diversidade. Saúde para a Fundação Oswaldo Cruz abriga todas essas dimensões. É assim desde 1900. Uma visão integrada da saúde. Na pesquisa, ensino, assistência, informação, comunicação, memória. Na promoção da saúde, na inovação. Onde permanentemente se pensam respostas para as necessidades da sociedade. Onde se faz ciência em defesa da vida. Você pode até não saber, mas carrega a Fiocruz dentro de você. Desenvolvemos e fabricamos vacinas, medicamentos, biofármacos, testes para diagnóstico. Formamos pessoas do nível médio a pós-graduação. Realizamos pesquisas para superar ameaças à saúde, para diminuir riscos ambientais, para prevenir doenças e agravos. Pesquisas que beneficiam crianças, adultos, idosos. Uma instituição pública e estratégica de Estado, integrante do Sistema Único de Saúde, com uma rica história de contribuições à sociedade. Presente de ponta a ponta no Brasil, onde cada trabalhador é um elo forte e ativo. Nela, ciência e saúde cumprem uma função social para o país e o mundo. Pés fincados na tradição. Olhos voltados para o futuro. Somos patrimônio da ciência e da saúde, da humanidade, do povo brasileiro. Estado do Rio Grande do Norte, no Nordeste Brasileiro, a Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Norte está entre as maiores universidades da região. Fundada em 25 de junho de 1958, possui uma área construída de aproximadamente 300 mil metros quadrados, que compõe os cinco campi distribuídos por todo o Estado. Tem hoje mais de 40 mil estudantes divididos em mais de 110 cursos de graduação, mais de 90 cursos de especialização, incluindo as residências, 80 cursos de mestrado e 40 de doutorado. Conta com mais de 2.300 professores, dos quais mais de 1.500 com doutorado. São mais de 1.900 projetos de pesquisas desenvolvidos pelos mais de 340 grupos de pesquisa cadastrados no CNPq, mais de 700 projetos de extensão e quatro programas permanentes, além de mais de 3 mil servidores técnicos administrativos. Como uma universidade de ampla atuação, as atividades de ensino, pesquisa e extensão se estendem a todas as áreas. Ciências humanas, ciências sociais, 
ciências exatas e da terra, ciências biológicas, ciências da saúde, tecnologias e artes. Entre as áreas de destaque da UFRN podemos citar o Instituto do Cérebro, que realiza pesquisas na área de neuroengenharia para o tratamento de doenças vasculares, epilepsia e outros distúrbios neurais. O Instituto Internacional de Física, que promove a troca de conhecimento científico com a comunidade internacional em áreas estratégicas. O Núcleo de Petróleo e Energias Renováveis, que por meio de parceria com a Petrobras, é considerado um dos maiores polos de pesquisa na área, formando mais de mil profissionais em níveis de graduação e pós-graduação. O Instituto de Medicina Tropical, que tem por objetivo o estudo de doenças infecciosas com maior incidência em continentes de clima tropical, como América do Sul, África e Ásia. O Instituto Metrópole Digital, que atua na formação técnica e acadêmica por meio da inclusão social e digital de jovens, desde o ensino básico até a pós-graduação. A Escola de Música da UFRN, que tem por objetivo educar, produzir, disseminar conhecimento e fazer música como forma de contribuir para o desenvolvimento humano, promover a justiça social, a democracia e a cidadania. Nossa escola acolhe mais de 20 grupos e a Orquestra Sinfônica da UFRN, uma das únicas orquestras universitárias do país. O NUPLAN, Núcleo de Pesquisa de Medicamentos e Alimentos, um laboratório oficial destinado à produção de medicamentos para o Sistema Público de Saúde Brasileiro. Entre suas atividades, o NUPLAN também oferece suporte acadêmico para a graduação e a pós-graduação, promovendo o ensino, a pesquisa, a extensão e a inovação tecnológica. O Ágora, Instituto de Línguas, Literaturas e Culturas Estrangeiras Modernas, que tem como principal objetivo oferecer cursos de língua estrangeira para estudantes, técnicos administrativos e professores da UFRN, bem como testes de proficiência para possibilitar a mobilidade internacional na universidade. O Ágora também recebe estudantes e pesquisadores das instituições parceiras da UFRN e de outros países, por meio do curso gratuito de português para estrangeiros. Na extensão, o programa de maior abrangência é o Trilhas Potiguares, que leva o conhecimento de professores e alunos aos municípios do interior do Rio Grande do Norte, em ações sociais desenvolvidas em parceria com as prefeituras municipais. Com mais de 20 anos de atuação, o sucesso desse programa já o levou também ao exterior, com a ida de nossas equipes a Moçambique, atuando com as equipes locais. Outra ação de relevo da instituição é a Semana de Ciência, Tecnologia e Cultura da Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Norte. Maior evento de atividades científicas, tecnológicas e culturais do Estado e um dos maiores palcos para a interface da UFRN com a sociedade. Em sua estrutura, a UFRN também dispõe de três hospitais universitários, dois deles na capital e um no interior. 22 bibliotecas, 3 museus, canal de TV digital, rádio, agência de comunicação, editora, núcleo de arte e cultura, núcleo de educação infantil, residência e restaurante universitário. Seu polo esportivo disponibiliza campos de futebol e de treinamento oficiais, ginásios, piscinas olímpica e semiolímpicas. Assim, a UFRN busca a excelência e a inovação acadêmica 
por meio da formação de profissionais capacitados e ações educacionais comprometidas com a produção de conhecimento articulado com a integração social e comunitária, desenvolvendo soluções para os problemas regionais, nacionais e internacionais.
generate, and spread knowledge to form transforming agents. This is the goal of the biggest university of Rio Grande do Sul, state northern region, and one of the biggest from the country's southern region. With half a century of history, UPF maintains its roots in educational excellence, research and extension incentive, and the constant search for technological innovation. There are nine campuses that are distributed around the region, and 12 academic units offering undergraduate, specialization, master's, doctorate, and postdoctorate courses. The infrastructure is a great differentiator. There are clinics, rooms for practical experimental teaching, laboratories, amphitheaters, auditoriums, and libraries with hundreds of thousands of titles available, both in physical and digital format. UPF stands out for the quality of teaching, academic investigative in nature, the dialogue with the community, the performance in the job market of professionals who have graduated from this institution, and by the qualified teaching staff with teachers who promote the renewal of methodologies for the teaching and learning process. The research incentive in the university generates and disseminates knowledge. The extension reinforces the university's commitment to the community with projects and programs that, through services provided, approximate academics to social reality and contribute to the sustainable development. Along with a university social responsibility policy, the institution promotes citizenship, environmental awareness, social inclusion, culture, and development. Major events are held at the university. An example is the National Journey of Literature, one of the greatest literary manifestations in Latin America. The Radio UPF and UPF TV broadcasters with open signal and educational character provide the community with cultural programming focused on local development. Facilitating access to higher education, the university has several lines of credit, scholarships and funding, benefiting more than 70% of students. One of them is the PAI, UPF's own financing program. Every semester, possibilities of exchange are offered to students through agreements with institutions in several countries. Acknowledgements strengthen the greatness of UPF. The university is among the best private institutions in Brazil. Its courses received grades 4 and 5 in the assessments made by the Ministry of Education. The institution has also received, in recent years, other important awards, such as social responsibility, granted by the State Legislative Assembly. The Planalto Mejo UPF Scientific Park contributes directly to the development of the region. Connecting innovation, science and technology, the UPF Parque with its technology-based incubator, supports and encourages innovative projects and local entrepreneurship. Providing quality of life, UPF offers to the academic community services that favor inclusion and permanence in higher education and the construction of great stories. The university has a community center, a leisure environment to eat, interact, and rest. This is the University of Paso Fundo, an institution that prioritizes ethical and humanistic formation. UPF. Knowledge is our nature.
Hello. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Flavio Celesi. It's a really, I, first of all, uh, I want to thank the invitation for pre being presenting uh, this, this uh, great researcher who is uh, Professor Koichi Kawakami. It's a great honor for me. Uh, Professor Kawakami is now at the, at the, is the leading the laboratory of molecular and developmental biology at the National, National Institutes of Genetics in Mijima, Japan. And he's, he's really, he has done a, a great uh, thing for the whole community of, of zebrafish. We all owe him a lot. A lot. Uh, apart from his, his more than 200 publications uh, who have been cited more, uh, nearly 20,000 times, he has been developing with his lab um, several techniques, technologies that are today very important for many of us. And one of them I want to remark is, is the development of the use of the TOL2 elements uh, for, for trans the transposons, the, tra the TOL2 transposon for doing transgenic in the zebrafish, which is a widespread use. And also using these techniques and, and others like like uh, uh, gene trapping and, and hazard trapping, he has been uh, generating with his lab uh, um, a great number of, of uh, transgenics and mutants, which are also available for the community. So the, this is a, a great value for all of us. Uh, so uh, we thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Kawagami, for being here today uh, to present your, your current work. Uh, hopefully tell, tell us how, how, is, how are those other technological projects going on as well. Thank you, and you are now live, and you can share your screen whenever you, you are ready. I'll talk about the transposon mediated genetic method in zebrafish, and their application to the study of functional neural circuit. So, first, first part, so I'll talk about the transposon element and genetic methods. And then, so I'll mention how we apply this method to the study of functional neuronal circuit. So zebrafish, as all you know, is a model vertebrate that has a small body size and fast embryogenesis and short generation time. And the genome size is about uh, half of us. And if if you put and male and female in the uh, fish tank, you, you will get like a hundred or even thousands of eggs in the morning. And this is my fish room. So uh, fish tanks are uh, put as uh, like a bookshelf. And by this way, you can keep uh, many different lines in a limited space. So, and this is a movie and uh, from the single cell to the so cell divide and thousand cells and four thousand cells. So cells start to move and gastration begins. So endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm is created. And then, so eyes, brain, and somite. <coughs> so uh, from the single cell to this stage, it, it takes only about, <coughs> about 20 hours. Uh, that is a big advantage of uh, zebrafish. However, so zebrafish is a re relatively new model animal. So in the uh, 1999, so uh, another model animal, uh, <coughs> Drosophila melanogaster, has some genetic methods like a, a P transposable element and has a trapping and the for US system. But for the zebrafish, uh, we uh, we didn't have any of these, but uh, <coughs> the effort of my lab and also other labs in the uh, 2000 by the 2009 uh, in zebrafish, so zebrafish, so transposon techniques uh, using TOL2 <coughs> had been developed, and also gene trapping and enhancer trapping, and gal for US system is. Uh, developed in zebrafish. So, uh, so TOL2 transposon, uh, and TOL2 transposon is a transposon from the Japanese medaka fish. So Japanese medaka fish is also a small uh, fish. 
uh, that has a gray color on the skin. But in the collection of in the Nagoya University, there was an um, albino mutant. So uh, <coughs> in, the, uh, in the collection in the Nagoya University. And the group of uh, Koga, Dr. Koga and Dr. Hori analyzed this albino mutant and found that DNA insert in the tyrosinase gene, uh, which is uh, essential for the pigmentation. And then they uh, cloned this and sequenced and found that the, uh, <coughs> so th this has a, a, a transposon-like sequence. So <coughs> uh, homology to the transposons of the hat family. So, and then, so we analyzed this transposon. So this transposon is about uh, uh, 4.8 kilobase long. And then, so the left, left end part and the right end part is essential for transposon. So we make serial deletion of the uh, left end and right end and find that only uh, 200 base pair from the left end and 150 base pair from the right end is essential for uh, transposition. So you can put any DNA fragment between this and then this transposon uh, works as a cassette. And so end-to-end uh, -to -end integration is, <coughs> is uh, guaranteed. So this is how we make transpos uh, transgenic fish using the transposon system. So uh, in this case, uh, so GFP gene is put in the, this left end and right end sequence. And you can co-inject uh, this transposon donor plasmid with transposes activity. In this case, transposes messenger RNA. So transposes gene has uh, four exons and three introns. And by cloning the cDNA, so you can uh, <coughs> generate uh, messenger RNA in vitro. And then, so these, if these uh, uh, co-injected, So, animation doesn't work. So, anim okay, because this is a, a not full slide mode, animation doesn't work, but when these are co injected into the zebrafish eggs, so transposes is synthesized in the cells. And then, recognize this uh, transposon cassette. And it, so th this cassette uh, at <coughs> excised from the uh, plasmid and integrated in the uh, zebra genomic DNA during the development. And if, when this happen in the future germ cells, so if you cross this injected fish to uh, a wild type fish, you can get the uh, transgenic fish in the next generation. So as you can see here uh, by southern blot analysis, so you see uh, in some cases single insertion and multiple insertion. So because this frequency is very high, so now so uh, ZBrush researcher use this transposon system as a <coughs> to, to make uh, transgenic zebra fish. So the merit of <coughs> transposon is, so we determined the minimum cis sequence essential for transposition and only 200 base pair from the left end and 150 base pair from the right end is essential. So you can put any DNA fragment between this short fragment. So TOL, and also TOL2 can carry more than 10 KB DNA. You can put more than 10 KB DNA or even you can put back DNA, like a, a 200 kilobase DNA in, uh, between this left and the right, right sequence. And the integration frequency is very high. And you can create a single copy integration. <coughs> and also uh, tra trans gene can be integrated from end to end. 
with no structural alterations. And also that <coughs> integration is catalyzed by transposes. Integration do not cause any gross real, un any <coughs> unwanted gross rearrangement at the target row side. So these are the merit for the uh, trans transgenesis using transposon. And by using this transposon system, we've been creating the, uh, developed the method of transgenesis, gene trapping, enhanced trapping, and the for us system. And also uh, transposon integration can mutagenize the gene. And so, so as, as I said, so you can even do the uh, back transgenesis, uh, <coughs> which is necessary to, uh, Analyze uh, to the analysis of enhancer element. So then, so I, I talk about gene trapping and enhancer trapping and again for US system. So uh, this is a gene trap and enhancer trap vector I uh, we created using the uh, true to transposon. So for the enhancer trap vector. We put uh, GAL4, so East transcription factor GAL4 downstream of HSP70 promoter, uh, which is uh, replaced at normal temperature. And in the case of gene trap, so uh, we put the splice acceptor upstream of GAL4 FF. So this is a, a principle of the gene trap and the extra trap. So in the gene trap vector, contains a, a reporter gene and the express acceptor. And when this uh, vector is integrated within the gene, and if uh, when this express acceptor trapped the endogenous tra transcript, so <coughs> this reporter will be expressed. For the enhancer trapping, so the uh, reporter gene is placed downstream of the uh, minimal promoter, like a uh, heat shock promoter, and then uh, when this enhancer trap vector is integrated with, within the gene or even outside of the gene, when this minimal promoter is influenced by the endogenous enhancer, so the reporter will be expressed. So this is a, a principle of gene trap and enhancer trap. And we created this uh, HSP plus uh, GAL4 <coughs> uh, enhancer trap vector and also uh, Express gene trap vector containing the express acceptor and the GAL4. And when this is integrated within the gene, then GAL4 is expressed. So to visualize the GAL4 fish, so we need some reporter fish. So GAL4, uh, uh, is GAL4 protein uh, specifically uh, bind to this US sequence? And by creating the US EGFP fish, so GFP will be, <coughs> by crossing this uh, uh, <coughs> line with uh, US GFP reporter fish, and <coughs> so you can visualize GAL4 expression as a, a GFP expression. So by this way, so you can visualize specific cell types. And, and also, so uh, you can create UAS effector uh, and transgenic fish. So you can put any gene of your interest downstream of UAS and then activate uh, this gene but, uh, in, in the uh, GAL4 expressing cells. And the, by the, that way, so you can manipulate uh, specific cells. And also integration itself uh, can be in such, uh, can, can uh, sometimes can cause insertion mutation also. So by <coughs> integrating such a gene trap construct or enhancer trap construct randomly on the genome, so uh, when you can, uh, so uh, <coughs> when the gene trap vector and enhancer trap vector is integrated within the uh, genome uh, randomly, and when uh, the, the construct is integrated within or near the, uh, like a brain specific gene. So you see such a, a clear brain patterns. And also you can see the, such a lens pattern or jaw pattern or uh, cells on the skin. And this is heart pattern. 
and this, some skeleton. So, but performing the gene trap screen, so you can create the uh, fish expressed the reporter gene in the uh, specific cell types. So, we we've been doing this uh, type of screen, gene trap screen, uh, since two thousand and four. So we inject the Galfo trap construct in zebrafish eggs and cross the injected fish with US GFP reporter fish. And when this construct is integrated with, <coughs> with the gene expressed in the eye, so you see the uh, green eye uh, embryo with green eyes. And by raising <coughs> this embryo, so uh, you see the uh, stable uh, transgenic line. And when we, you analyze this FR fish by southern blotting, so some has a single insertion, but some has a multiple insertion. And the, it is so one, one of the insertion should be related to the, to the uh, pattern you observed. And so uh, when we, identify the fish with a single insertion. So we perform the inverse PCR and DNA sequencing and so uh, de determine the transposon integration site. And after that, so we uh, stock the frozen sperm. So, and when we see a uh, multiple insertion, and so we outcross this fish again to the uh, wild type fish and and uh, identify the fish with single insertion in next generation. And then we, if when we identify the fish with single insertion, we perform the inverse PCR and then making the uh, frozen sperm. So uh, this is the pattern we, uh, we isolated. Uh, part of pattern we isolated, as you can see, so many different parts of the body is labeled with uh, this gene trap construct. So by now, so we generated more than 2,000 transgenic lines uh, that express gal in uh, specific cell types. And also we uh, <coughs> mapped the transposal integration site, uh, <coughs> more than uh, 300 transposal integration site and identified the gene. Uh, trapped by this gene trap construct. Then, so we make the frozen spam for all of this. And my fish room has like a, a 2,500 tanks and 400 lines are kept alive in the fish room. And so because, so there are many uh, researchers working on different part of the zebrafish body so uh, organogenesis or th those kind of things. And uh, we uh, <coughs> set up the collaboration with such an expert and then uh, published more than 100 collaborative papers in the past. Now also you can check uh, these transgenic fish by our database. So when you uh, go to our database, you see the, uh, this, uh, <coughs> Uh, these uh, regions of the body in the uh, left column. And then if you click the uh, the place of your interest, the transgenic line that has an expression in that region appear on the uh, right hand side. And by clicking these icons, so you can go to the uh, <coughs> okay. When you click the brain, so you will see the more than 700 lines. When you click the heart, you will see like a 200 lines. And if you click these icons, you can jump to the uh, <coughs> the genome information. So you, you can know uh, where the transposon construct is integrated on the genome. And also you see the uh, gene trapped by this transposon integration. So, it, so you can jump to this information. So by using this uh, transgenic resource and also this database, 
I encouraged, so actually,、uh, this is an email I, I sent to the general researcher on 2012. So,、uh, <coughs> so I encouraged、uh, general researchers to <coughs> visit my lab and look at the pattern by their own eyes. And then、uh, I, I'm really happy for them to find the transcendent. Genic line use, useful for, for their research, so so called. So, I in, encouraged <coughs> shelf screen in my lab. Actually, so, so <coughs> the mission of my institute is to help the、uh, researchers in the inside of Japan and also worldwide. So <coughs> Our institute has some system to support the、uh, travel expense uh, for uh, researchers、uh, who visited to my lab and performed the、uh, shelf screen. So, if you are、uh, uh, interested in my、uh, <coughs> transgenic trans resource and also uh, uh, look at uh, the, the transgenic line.、Uh, Expression pattern by your own eyes. So,、uh, think about applying for、uh, such travel support from our institute. Actually, so many researchers visited my lab and also some、uh, climb up to the Mount Fuji, which is located close to our institute. So, then I moved to the、uh, next part of my talk. So, how We apply this, this method or transgenic resource to the、uh, study of the functional, functional neural circuit. So, th the idea is very simple. So, uh, uh, so we have the, a lot collection of Galfour lines and selecting the、uh, brain specific Galfour lines. And then, so we Uh, develop the system to image the neural activity in uh, these uh, specific neur neurons. And also, we develop, developed the system to inhibit the neural activity of the,、uh, uh, these specific、uh, neurons. So, actually, Akira, Muto,、uh, pra, Akira and Pradeep and Hideyuki works on this project. And, So, to visualize the neural activity, we developed US G camp tra、uh, transient line. And to inhibit the neural activity, so we、uh, developed US、uh, botulinum toxin GFP transient lines. So, first, I will take, talk about this part. So, G camp is a, a variant of the GFP. In the middle part, the N terminus and C terminus of EGFP is switched. And then, so a、uh, calmodulin sequence is attached to the、uh, C terminus. So,、uh, and M13 sequence came from the myosin protein. And when、uh, uh, calcium ion binds to this calmodulin domain, so this binds to M13. And causing the structure change in the middle part. So, by this way, so、uh, when the concentration of cellular calcium increases, so GFP increases its intensity. So, because so when neuron fires, so a lot of calcium、uh, influx occurs and Uh, the cellular concentration of、uh, neuron is increased. So, but then by measuring the GFP intensity, so you can,、uh, you can know the activity of neurons. There's many g c a m proteins, and we improved uh, US g c a m prime. By using the、uh, newest、uh, GCAM proteins. So, this is a, a visualization of the、uh, motor neuron、uh, 
using the GCAMP protein. So in our uh, transgenic collection, we have the uh, uh, transgenic line that label uh, motor neurons. So you can see the, uh, this big motor neuron in the uh, spinal cord. And these neurons, motor neuron, extend the axon to the uh, trunk muscles. And when GCAMP is expressed in these motor neurons, so this case, so the uh, embryo, uh, <coughs> zebra shell embryo is alive, but fi are fixed. And we observe the uh, motor neuron activity from the top. And it should, should color. So you see the, this, uh, so the, this, this side of neuron fires simultaneous, simultaneously. And also this side of neurons are fire simultaneously, but this left right <coughs> signal is, uh, you see the alternating signal from the left and right. So this is, uh, you know, uh, this motor neuron, this activity uh, control the uh, larval swimming, so spontaneous swimming. So you can visualize the activity of motor neuron by using the motor neuron GALFO lines and also by using the US GCAMP lines. So then, so we try to visualize the activity in the brain. So this is a, a five-day uh, zebra shilaba, and the, here's the paramecia. So five day zebra shilaba can see the paramecia and chase it and catch it. And also five day zebra fish. Uh, in this case, this is not paramecia. This is a air bubble. Uh, sorry. Sorry, again. So this is an air, air bubble. So, so zebra can recognize such a small object and they eat it, but but don't eat it because, uh, so he, he can tell this is not food. And this similar activity is observed in the uh, human baby. So from the uh, visual stimuli, so activate some appetite. So I uh, actually, we try to identify this neural circuit in zebrafish. And also <laughs> conclusion is, so when zebra recognize prey like paramecia, so the visual signal go into the retina and transfer to uh, tectum, and then te tectum signal goes to the pretectum, and the, so zebrafish recognize this as a prey, and then signal go to the uh, lateral hypothalamus, so inferior lobe of hy hypothalamus, and then activate. So this is a feeding center. Uh, in the brain, and then so <laughs> a visual uh, object, a visual signal <laughs> can stimuli can. Uh, so this is a pathway. Uh, visual stimuli activate the feeding center. So we uh, <laughs> show that this pathway by uh, calcium imaging. So first to look at the uh, activity in the tectum. So this is how we see the object. And zebrafish also uh, signal from the right eye goes to the uh, left tectum and the signal from the left eye goes to the right tectum. So to see the activity of tectum, so we picked up the uh, uh, Garfo line that specifically express GAL4 strongly and specifically express GAL4 in the tectum. 
So then, so use this line to express G camp in the tectal cells. So this is a top view of the zebrafish brain. And you see this tectal cells. And here's the uh, <coughs> neuropil area. So this, the axon from the retina <coughs> forms synapse with uh, tectal cells. And this is a spontaneous activity of in the tectum. So you will see, clearly see these single neurons and then these neurons extend the projection to this area. So as you can see, so in some cells, so uh, intensity increase. This is a spontaneous uh, firing of neurons in the tectal area. So then we try to image the how the tectum recognize the paramecia. So here's a paramecia and here's a zebrafish. And the zebrafish is embedded in the agaros at the neck and the zebrafish can't move, but still alive. And then making the small water space in front of zebrafish and then paramecia swim around this area. So as you can see, you can see the signal in the brain. And when paramecia is this side, this side of brain is activated. And when paramecia is this side, this side of brain is activated. So this is a, a, a three, three times speed of the uh, real time calcium imaging. So this way, so, uh, <laughs> so such a uh, paramecia movement is uh, visualized on the on the zebrafish brain and interestingly so this case so paramecia is stopped and when paramecia is stopping so you don't see any activity in the brain but when paramecia start to move you see the activity uh, in the zebrafish brain <laughs> meaning that a uh, zebrafish can only see a, a moving object. So this way, so we see that the signal from the uh, retina eye uh, transferred to the uh, tectums. And then, so to, uh, uh, to see this pathway, we use these uh, two transgenic lines. So this is uh, one transgenic line expressing the GARFO in the uh, pretectum area, these cells, and also this is uh, another GALFO line that has expressed GALFO in this uh, lateral hypothalamus. And first, by using this uh, pretectum lines, it's a bit difficult, but you see this part, this part intensity increase when paramecia approaching. And this activity is in, induced by some small spot So this activity is detected. So then, so we see the, so this is a predictor cells and then we traced the axon of this predictor cells and found that the axon goes to this area. So lateral hypothalamus area. And this is another line expressed GALFO in the uh, lateral hypothalamus. And when, this line is used for imaging. So when paramecia comes, you see the so activity of the lateral hypothalamus is increased. So by this way, so paramecia activate a feeding center. And when uh, we cross the zebrafish, and this is a, a triple transgenic, that, that expressed a G camp in the pretectum, both pretectum and hypothalamus. So, when paramecia approaching, you see the both pretectum and hypothalamus is activated.
So, uh, you, you can analyze uh, the function of these neurons by ablating neurons. So, in zebrafish, <laughs> by using the laser microscope, you can ablate uh, specific neurons if you can see the neurons. So here's the pretectal cells, and but this fish, so this pretectal cell is ablated by laser. So by using this fish, we analyze the feather. Uh, this fish has eat paramecia. So this small object is paramecia, and the fish eat the paramecia. So we make the very shallow. Uh, shallow dish and then uh, take the movie. And the wild type zebrafish can consume paramecia efficiently. But if when these protector cells are ablated, so zebrafish eat less, meaning that this protector cell is uh, important for the uh, to evoke the uh, appetite and also uh, important for, for hunting. So by this experiment, we, we identify the pathway that the, the uh, visual stimuli activate the feeding center. And also we know that this activity is uh, moderated by uh, activity of another brain. So by using, um, <clears throat> by analyzing this pathway, so we can know so how <laughs> this activi activi activity is modulated by satiety or hunger or some stress or those kind of, thing, those kind of <clears throat> things. That, that may uh, yeah, be also uh, <laughs> important to understand the uh, uh, pathology of the hu human eating defect. And this is a, a calcium imaging. And then, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, we, how we inhibit the neural activity in the Galapho US system. So to analyze the neural circuit, the idea is very simple. So by taking the uh, brain specific Galapho lines, and then, so then inhibit the activity by using a neurotoxin and analyzing the, the, the behaviors. So brain specific GALFO lines, especially, so we are interested in the uh, structure called amygdala and hippocampus. So this is a mouse brain and the amygdala is important for the, uh, <laughs> to, uh, Emotion related behaviors, emotional behaviors, motivation, and also fear learning. And the hippocampus is in, uh, <coughs> important to form the long term memory and also spatial navigation, spatial and temporal and contextual learning. And the fish brain is different from the uh, mammalian brain, but the basic structure is common between the fish and mammals. So, and then when you cut the telencephalon, so uh, from the anatomical studies, uh, this uh, dorsal medial area uh, should, co is a, should correspond to amygdala. And this dorsal lateral area should co uh, correspond, correspond to the hippocampus. But there, there's no clear evidence for the uh, such uh, for the uh, fish amygdala and fish hippocampus, actually, so uh, some one experiment is done using the goldfish. So they ablated the entire telencephalon, this black part, or a lateral side of telencephalon, or a medial part of the telencephalon, and and analyze the uh, behavior of the goldfish, and then. Uh, they think that this area is important for fear conditioning, and this area is 
uh, important for the uh, some contextual learning. But this is a, a, a ablation experiment, and we want to perform this ex ex experiment by using the uh, uh, transgenic fish, so genetically. So in our collection, so we we searched our collection, uh, transgenic collection, and found that the so this line expresses GALFO in the uh, medial part of the telencephalon. And this line, as you can see, express uh, GALFO in the lateral part of the telencephalon. So uh, this should label <laughs> some hippocampal cells, and this should label some amygdala lines. And so by using this GALFO line, so inhibit the neural activity by such a GALFO line with US uh, botulinus toxin GFP line, so neurotoxin lines. So botulinus toxin is a uh, neurotoxin that <coughs> inhibit the uh, uh, <coughs> release of the neurotransmitter at the uh, synapse. Uh, by this way, so botulinus toxin, when botulinus toxin is ex expressed in the neurons, uh, <coughs> it inhibit the neural activities. So we created the US uh, Botox lines. So by crossing the brain specific GALFO line to the US uh, neurotoxin line, and then we analyze the behavior. So to <coughs> analyze the behavior, we set up the behavior system. <coughs> also it's a, a fear conditioning, non-trace active avoidance fear conditioning. And also trace active avoidance fear conditioning. And also we set up the system for uh, spatial learning. And this <coughs> behavior is thought to be related to amygdala and hippocampus. So first, this is a, uh, our system for the non-trace active avoidance fear conditioning. So this is a apparatus. This apparatus uh, looked like uh, gel electrophoresis apparatus, but so we put the uh, green LED this side and putting the uh, platinum mesh for the electric shock. And so fish is put in this apparatus. And when light is on, and 10 seconds later, so we give them uh, elec electric shock. Now fish is shocked. And by repeating this 10 times a day for five days, fish is very smart, clever. Uh, so they learn to escape from the light. So when light on, so fish escapes to another end. So this is a learning curve and 6% of the zebrafish can learn escape. So this is a learning curve of fish and using the mouse. So this fear conditioning is done using the tone and uh, electric shock from the foot. And this is a learning curve of mouse. And as you can see, so zebrafish uh, is as smart as mouse, so you can do the experiment. And then, so this is a transgenic line that label the uh, <coughs> media, uh, those medial part of the transcephalon. So this is, so we make the uh, uh, transparent brain and analyze the pattern by light sheet microscope. And you can see here, so the cell bodies are here and projection goes to the hypothalamus area. So this is a, a <laughs> in this uh, GALFO transgenic line, so there's some uh, dose medial DM cells are labeled. And when this DM cell is close to the US neurotoxin line and inhibit the activity of these neurons, so fish can't perform the uh, fear learning. <coughs> 
indicating that uh, this neuron is essential for the uh, fear conditioning. And also, so we set up the uh, trace active avoidance fear conditioning. This is kind of ep episodic learning. So in this scheme, so uh, using the same apparatus after light on, then light off. And after light off, so the shock is given. So like, uh, during training. So light is on. And after light is off, shock is given. So two, and fish, after training, fish is again very smart. When light is on, Fish looks sinking a little, but learn to escape. So when you make such a gap, so uh, it's so that the hippocampal function is required. Then this is another line. So I, I told you, so leveling the uh, those lateral part of the trans transferon. And this is, uh, uh, again, transparent brain observed by light sheet microscope. So you can see uh, these cells has a network within the tracephalon. And when this, uh, those lateral <coughs> neural cells are inhibited by neurotoxin, so this fish can perform the uh, trace fear conditioning. So trace conditioning, right? So you, you probably remember that the shock is given uh, when the light light on. But this fish, uh, when crossed to the neurotoxic fish, can't perform the uh, trace fear conditioning. So the learning uh, paradigm that has this gap, meaning that the this fish amygdala function, DM function is okay, but because hippocampus function is somehow depressed. So this fish couldn't run the, this uh, trace active avoidance fear conditioning. And also this is a special learning we set up for the zebra fish. So we created these four rooms in the tank. And before training, so fish uh, swim rather randomly. But during training, so we <laughs> make some tricks. So when fish enter the, this G2, so some electric valve is open and then we give the fish a small amount of food. So when fish come into the G2, we give the fish a small amount of food. And then fish memorize this D2 part. So this is actually set up. We observed the fish tank by CCD from the top and then monitor the fish movement on the this display. And when fish enter the G2, so electric valve is open and food is given. If a uh, fish <coughs> trained, so then the so fish is start from either, either G3 or G4, and the fish goes to the, go straight to the G2. Actually selection for the G, G2 is like a 25% uh, before the training, but after the special learning training, so fish, uh, the frequency that fish goes to G2 is increased. But again, so when the activity of the, this neuron is inhibited, 
So this frequency is go, goes down, indicating that these neurons are important for the spatial learning. So by taking this DM, di <coughs> DM line and the DL lines, so this fish uh, failed to perform the non-trace active avoidance fear conditioning, <laughs> indicating that so this area is uh, these neurons are uh, important for uh, emotional learning <laughs> should should correspond to the uh, amygdala function in our brain, and this fish <clears throat> when so. Uh, activity of these neurons are uh, inhibited. So can perform the fear conditioning, non-trace active avoidance fear conditioning, but couldn't perform the trace active avoidance fear conditioning when you know uh, the gap is created by light signal and light stimulus and uh, electric shock. So this fish couldn't uh, learn uh, the learn to escape by this paradigm. But, and also this fish when crossed with a neurotoxin line, so failed to uh, perform spatial learning. And by this way, we think that this medial neuron uh, is equivalent or homologue of the uh, mammalian amygdala. And this neuron contains the activity of hippocampus. So uh, we generated the transient lines that express gal in special regions in the adult brain. And uh, so we can manipulate uh, the function of these neurons if we got such a gal line. So we cross this gal line to the US neurotoxin line and can inhibit the neural activity. And then, so by analyzing the behaviors, so uh, DM lines is crossed with US neurotoxin line and but such fish couldn't perform uh, fear learning. And also uh, when DL lines is crossed to the neurotoxin line, they couldn't perform the uh, non-trace uh, non mm, active, sorry, as, a so couldn't perform trace active avoidance, uh, meaning that so this uh, neurons are important for such uh, uh, episodic learning. <laughs> and also, so such fish couldn't perform the spatial learning. And sh so this neuron should correspond to hippocampal activity. So by this way, so if you have the correction of the GALFO lines expressed the GALFO, especially <coughs> GALFO in the special brain areas, you can tell the function of such a neurons by this method. And finally, so I'd like to thank my Lavo members for this work. And so by uh, development of the transposon <coughs> technology and creating, generating the uh, transgenic resource, I'd like to thank European Generation Society of, uh, Give, give me a uh, uh, 2021 uh, Christian in the same four award. So thank you very much. Thank you for uh, attention. And now I can have the uh, question. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Kawakami. It was a great talk uh, spanning the whole uh, the whole enterprise of of, of uh, getting this this uh, these great tools and then using them and showing a, a great example that so many people has been using not only you because you have been sharing them with with uh, so many other labs. Yeah. So now we are open for questions. Um, I can I will just check uh, if we have questions in the YouTube uh, channel. So YouTube is up now. Yes, it should be. Uh, Second, because, uh... Tomato, I'm telling you, all neurons. So this is, so this is a question. Do do oh, I? Okay, have... there is this a, there is a question there. 
Do, do, can you read that? Do you have any transgenic yeah, lying yeah. or, or told to? I, I, yeah, okay. I will repeat the question. Okay. okay, you can repeat the question. I, I can read. I can yeah, read it. Can. I can read it if you ask, and, and then you ask. So, do you have any transgenic line or? Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry, okay. I was listening to myself. Uh, in the, okay, uh, the, the question is: yes. Do you have any transgenic line or told to plasmid with tomato or MTD in all neurons? So, the definition of all neurons is very difficult. So like a pan, nothing can be hundred percent, but we have a lot of neuron lines, and there's a, a some a famous neuron promoter like a Hugh C or something like that. And if, we, if you attach the uh, such a tomato or MCD, eh? tomato and MCD has a red color, a red fluorescent. So if you at, attach such a uh, Red fluorescent protein to the uh, neural promoter, you can easily create it. And actually, we have such lines. And also, using the uh, Gal for US system, so we have the US, uh, actually, it's not MHL. We have a US scarlet line. Scarlet is brighter than MHL and uh, uh, <coughs> tomato, I think. So we have a, a US scarlet line. And then, so by crossing the uh, some neuronal uh, GALFO line to such a US scarlet line, so you can visualize the uh, neurons in red fluorescence. So that is my answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I yeah. think this was the only question that was <laughs> so far posted in the chat. Are there any other questions? I oh, know this one here. Sorry, do you have any transgenic line with GFP in the PT? Uh, I think we have a, we have a lot. If you uh, look at our database, you can easily find the transgenic line with a pituitary expression. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was that was the last one, right, guys? I think so. Okay, so that's great. Uh, I thank Professor Kawakami for for this uh, wonderful talk and yeah. and to drive us through all the all this uh, lifetime <laughs> endeavor of of, of uh, getting these tools. And I, I remark and remember people that that uh, these tools are available and and you can check in, in the website and, and and see which one can maybe be your favorite. And, and he and Kawakami will, Professor Kawakami will be happy to, to send them, right? Yeah, you, um, you, you can send, send, send them as a request. Or, so as I said, so uh, my institute has a system to support yeah. travel expense. So That's the right. deadline is every December or November or December every year. So if you are interested in coming to my lab and look at our transient line, so you may apply for uh, such a travel grant. Yeah, yeah that's actually, another wonderful opportunity. Actually, in October, someone from the Colombia, Colombia, uh, will arrive at my lab. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I think there are no more questions. Um, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Hello. Hi all, so let's go to our next presentation. I will introduce you, uh, Miss Bobby Barr. Hello, Bobby. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you. So I will introduce you and then you can share your screen and start your presentation. Uh, so Ms. Wa graduated in political science, but fell in love with zebrafish many years ago and has been working as the international representative 
um, at Aquanil for seven years. She's also the main organizer of the annual Husband Week workshop. So thank you again, Bobby. You can share screen. This stage is yours. Okay, let's see if we can make this work. Okay. And now, is that okay? Yes, yes, we can see, we can see okay. your screen. Okay, yes. very good. Um, I can't see me though, that's too bad, but okay. Okay, so thank you very much, um, organizers, for inviting us to participate in this really wonderful um, workshop. It's really great. And of course, moving the zebrafish model forward is always something we all share as a goal. Um, so Aquaneering has been working with zebrafish for over 20, well, 22 years. Um, we're internationally recognized. We have a unique no maintenance biological filtration system and we have worldwide aquatic lab installations. So I know from my experience in the last several years being the international rep that uh, things change from country to country. There's different requirements, but some things stay the same. And so today I will be talking about um, zebrafish labs, planning ahead. Um, I know some of you have a lot of experience with zebrafish labs. You already have your own lab for many years. Some of you probably have less experience. Maybe some of you have no experience. So I hope that everyone will get a little something out of our talk today um, about planning ahead. Uh, it definitely saves money uh, if you plan ahead. You know, it's like everything, if you try and put something in later, it costs more than if you put it in at the beginning. Um, if you think ahead, you can ensure that the space will address your needs. You know, you might only need one rack now, but if you think ahead, you can prepare for a time when you might expand. Uh, it makes the facility installation smoother and it prevents costly changes and setbacks. So sometimes people are surprised to find that there are a lot of different things besides the housing that require attention. Uh, housing typically takes 40 to 50 percent of the space, but depending on your research needs and, and you know, what you feed your fish, et cetera, you have room space needed for the filtration system, for tank washing and storage. It's surprising how much storage is required for some of these systems. Um, counter space and sinks to work on food prep areas, depending on if you use live feed, which most, most people do now, and uh, space for breeding. So here's an example of a layout. And this is a central filtration system. You can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows of racks. Uh, it, it makes sense to think about how many times the people working with the fish are going to have to go up and down the rows. You know, some, some facilities have to, because of space requirements, make long rows like this, but then you're spending a lot of time going up and down and, and it's not very ergonomically um, accessible to your workspace. So here we have sinks readily available near the racks and a workspace also readily available. This particular layout shows a quarantine room that is separate from the space. That is obviously um, preferred and, and typical, although sometimes people have to have a quarantine rack in the same space. It isn't really quarantine anymore because of the possibility of airborne diseases. Um, here's a nice large space for storage. And in this uh, example, the filtration room is actually separate from the housing room. So I would say maybe 20 to 30 percent of our installations have the filtration in a separate room. There's benefits to that. Uh, the noise is reduced in the housing room. You can have people working in the filtration room who don't interfere with people who are working with the fish in the housing room. Um, but it can be made to work either way. And then here there's a food prep room. Um, I'll show you an example of some food prep equipment later, but it's nice if you can have a separate room, especially if you're using brine shrimp because they require continual lighting. And as we'll talk about also later, you need to be able to have darkness at night for the light cycle for your fish. And so having the brine shrimp uh, in a separate room is preferable. 
And as I mentioned, so you want to have a nice workflow. This shows the ends of the racks here. And these are um, trays for breeding tanks and immediately across the way from the sinks and the, and the workspace. So as I said, you don't you know, you know it, you're going to spill water as you're walking through the space. It, it just makes it a lot easier if you're closer and don't have to walk far. Over time, um, you know, if you have to walk a long ways every single day, it, it really starts to wear on you. So depending on the type of research, uh, you may need a whole bunch of embryos. And if so, you'll need a lot of um, like crossing tanks of various sizes. We'll take a look at those in a minute too. But there's uh, like this shows single crossing tanks on shelves at the end of the row. Uh, if you're doing a lot of genotyping, you're going to need a lot of small tanks, or in this case, we have what we call our DC-96 tanks, and they allow 24 fish in each one of these little tank containers. It has 24 compartments. It can be on the system flow, which is good, um, so that you, know, you don't have to manually change the water in those uh, tanks, but it all depends on what your research needs are. Some people don't need any, any of this, they just need maybe, you know, some people need large tanks for large groups of fish. So it, it all depends on what your research needs are and it can be established at the very beginning when you're designing your lab. Here's some examples of live feed. Here's some uh, brine shrimp patchers on a sink, hopefully in a separate room from where the housing is. Uh, here's an example of some rotor for feed stations and, and here's a mix of both. By the way, I am going a little bit quickly because I know we have a little bit of time to make up. So hopefully uh, at the end, if there are any questions, I can answer them if I've gone too quickly over something. Or, uh, of course, you can feel free to contact me later. So tank cleaning and washing. So if you have like a small to medium sized lab, an under counter washer is really very convenient uh, for washing your tanks. Um, we'll talk a little bit about location later, but if you have access to a, a tank washing um, machine where you can be assured that you won't have detergent from when the mice cages are, are washed, you know, coming into your tanks, then that also is an option is to use a shared um, tank washing facility. And speaking of location, uh, it's it's very important to consider this when you are looking at sites for your facility because water weighs a lot. So you don't have to think about this so much with mice, rats, um, offices, that kind of thing. But, you know, rats can weigh one to two thousand pounds each and the floor loading is, is like 50 to 100 pounds per square foot. Um, that is a lot, especially if you're on some floor that's not the basement. Uh, most of the labs are on the lower floors, like the basement or the first floor, but uh, <laughs> we like to use this example. Uh, this is the University of Pittsburgh uh, under construction many years ago. It's a very large facility, but you can see the electrical, um, the central electrical for the whole building covered in green here. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of reinforcement that had to be made above that because the fish facility went on the floor above it. And, you know, it's worked out well, but it's not the ideal situation. You really need to know what is below you. Um, also, when you're talking about location, you want to think about uh, proximity to utilities. Uh, you know, will the room that you're looking at have the power available for the various equipment that you're bringing in? Um, how close are you to the cage wash areas? How close are you to your lab? Uh, you don't really want to be walking you know, long ways back and forth between working with the fish and then and working in your lab um, necessarily. And then sensitive building equipment, as I said, this is like the, the main electrical supply for the whole building. That's very sensitive. Uh, sometimes you might have uh, the floor below you might have very, very expensive um, computer equipment or imaging equipment. And, you know, when we look at the floors, I'll say it again, but, the, you know, there's there's a lot of water and you know, you don't expect to have some kind of uh, horrible flood, but sometimes it happens. And so knowing what's below you is very important. 
the walls, ceilings, and floors. So this is also different from typical um, workspaces. It needs to, needs to be non-absorbent, um, water resistant for sure. Uh, no seams is important, especially in the floor. So, you know, your typical flooring, like I'm looking at my floor right now, you have uh, the floor and then the cove and it meets at the bottom of the, of the wall, but that's not a good idea, especially as I mentioned, let's say you have some kind of a flooding situation or even for the small amounts of water that inevitably get on the floor in the lab, uh, they will soak into those seams and they can damage the wall behind uh, that. And so what you really want is you want um, a coving. You want a non-skid floor and you want a coving that goes up without a seam, at least three or four inches, maybe I think six might be the standard. Um, countertops, you want to stay away from metal countertops, especially under the live feed stations because they have a lot of salt involved. Um, so, I mean, you can use stainless steel countertops. It's not recommended. You can wipe it down. But something like Trespa um, or an epoxy resin is, is recommended. So you want to think about future expansion, as I mentioned. And... Um, so it depends on, you know, sometimes if you already are working with some other model and you are you just want to start with a very small rack to see how it goes. Um, we have a build as you grow rack. You start with one filter system and you can have as little as one shelf to begin. And then you can add shelves as as you grow, build as you grow. So you can get up to six shelves added to your initial filtration system. Um, so that's that's one way to start small and then and then build. And then in the other picture, you can see this is a large central filtration system. And you can see two rows have been installed here, but there is a filter system on the other side of this wall that is already set up to be able to handle like three or four more rows. And so you just have the connections here at the end of the row of racks installed in phase one, ready to just move on and install phases two and three. So if you, have the funds at the beginning and can actually put in most of the filtration system that you think you will eventually need. It saves a lot of time, money, and distraction. Um, you know, if you have to go in and, and put in a whole new filter system while you already have a, a system running, it's a lot more difficult than just turning on and connecting um, a system that you have put in in advance, planning ahead. When we talk about the cost of the equipment and planning ahead, I, wa I want to talk a little bit about standalone systems versus a central filtration system. So uh, a standalone system, such as our build as you grow rack that goes up or just, you know, a six shelf standalone rack, it has its own recirculating filtration system here. You, most of you know about this. Um, but let's say you need two racks and let's say it's OK if they're all on the same water zone. So we can provide two racks and connect them. They can share a dosing and monitoring system. We can provide a rack that's ready to be added to so that you can add a second or even a third rack later. So that can save a lot of money if you can link your water zones because you only need one dosing and monitoring system. Um, it's less labor for your staff uh, tracking things, et cetera. Some people need many standalone racks on different water zones. But we've done up to nine standalone racks in one space, but each with its own dosing and monitoring. It, it depends on the research needs. Once you get up to three standalone racks, and let's say you're looking at a fourth rack, then it's time to think about a central filtration system. Um, so at four racks, the cost of the central filtration system is less than four standalone racks. And if you think you might ever need five or six or eight um, racks on your system, then it's a good idea to start with a central filtration system with as much ability to grow as, as you think you will need. It can be changed later. Let's say you start with a central filtration system that can handle up to eight racks and later you want to add two more and you have the space for it. You know, we can uh, retrofit the pumps and, and work with you to do that. Uh, but it does make sense to think ahead, you know, years down the line uh, and, and plan ahead for as much capacity as you think you will ever need. 
So, um, of course, water is everything for us in the zebrafish community. There's water in, the water filtration and conditioning, and then the water out. So water in, the, you need to produce and have water available and store it for your fish. Uh, there's a number of different ways to do this. So that you're probably going to need some kind of pre-filtration, even if you have a really good supply of well water um, or some kind of municipal water with no chlorine, you, you probably still want to have some kind of mechanical filtration to make sure you remove impurities from the water. I know some labs that don't do this. They, they either bring in seawater if it's a saltwater system or they bring in well water and they're perfectly fine with that and it works for them. Uh, but typically, if you're using municipal water, you're going to have chlorine in it. You need to remove that. So you can do that with carbon filters. Uh, or what has kind of become the industry standard is reverse osmosis water. And so there are a number of systems on the market. Uh, even if your facility has reverse osmosis water available to you, it's a good idea to have a storage tank because sometimes the facility systems can go down. Uh, sometimes they can have some kind of a contamination in them. And you definitely want to have enough in your storage tank to last you for a couple of days worth of water exchanges. Um, so even if you have an incoming RO water supply and you can do your timed exchange directly from that via a solenoid, you still should have, in our opinion, um, a storage tank for that. So there's also DI water, um, you know, it's not recommended. It removes everything. You have to put a lot of things back in when, when you remove things. Uh, it's very important when you are first designing your system to get a water test of the incoming water in the building. You wanna check for hardness, um, metals, that kind of a thing. If you have really hard water incoming, then you, you, know, you probably need a water softener. These are all things to look at before you set everything up so that you don't have to find a place to put the water softener and plug it in later. It's something that you, you plan for in advance because you know what kind of water you're dealing with when it comes in. Um, you need to have more water than you would think. So first you need to be able to fill your system and then you have to have enough water for the daily water exchange, which typically is 10%, although that's changing. We're discussing whether it's really needed to be 10%. Uh, some people are starting to do some, some experiments to see really what uh, percentage of water exchange is needed that can keep your system at optimum um, water quality, but use as little uh, replacement water, exchange water as, as possible. And then you also need water for additional things like for your breeding tanks. Um, you need system water for that. For tank washes and cleaning, you often need to be able to rinse with RO water or system water. And then for live feed cultures. This is a new thing, kind of new. It's new to, new to me. Uh, at the last IZFS, we had a, uh, a session talking about sustainability in zebrafish labs. It was really, really interesting. Um, and there's a lot of things that can be done in zebrafish labs to be more sustainable. You know, things like turning off your computers when you leave and making sure the lights are off and fume hoods, having the doors closed. But of course, with us, water is the main thing. And there is a lot of water that goes down the drain if you're using reverse osmosis. Uh, typically, you get about 75 70 to 75% reject water with a reverse osmosis system. That is a lot of water. Um, I know that there are some companies now that are working to, to switch that so that you have 75% usable water and 25% reject water. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can increase the uh, operation of your RO water maker, especially by the incoming water temperature. So that's something to look at as well. If you're going to be using a reverse osmosis system, uh, the output changes drastically depending on the incoming water temperature. So for whichever system you purchase, look at what incoming water temperature is required. And if you can uh, provide you know, a mix of water, cold and warm, and so that it gets the required temperature, provides you a lot 
more water and the machine works less hard. Uh, it's, it's just really the way to, way to go. Um, Another thing that can be done for some people, especially if you have a system on the first level of the building, is you can send your reject water out to, uh, you know, water the plants, water the surrounding landscape. Uh, there are people doing this. Um, Dr. Whitlock, the current uh, president of the IZFS, uh, in, and she has her system in Chile, has set up a really interesting system where she reuses basically all of her reject water um, and so it's, of course, depending on what your research is, you would have to look into what is in the water that you're letting out, if there's some kind of parasites or depending on what your research is, it, you may not be able to do that, but it's something to consider. So once you get the water in and have it stored and, and have it ready to go, then you need to filter it. Typically there's a four stage filtration system, uh, mechanical, biological finishing, and then UV sterilization. As I mentioned before, Aquaneering uses an upwelling fluidized bed biofilter. Uh, it's, you know, we, it's a lot smaller footprint than some of the other types of media that you can use for your biological filtration. Um, and it has really oversized um, surface area. So it really does provide an excellent water quality. And then for mechanical, there's a number of different kinds of things like this is right here are some automatic backwashing filters. Uh, you can also have reusable filter trays at the rack sump level or even filter pads, although people are trying to move away from those to you know, cut down on consumable use um, and then UV sterilization. So uh, you have your water circulating, but you also need to maintain the pH and salinity levels. So you can do this by hand, of course. If you have one rack, it's very easy. If you have a couple of standalone racks, you can certainly do this by hand. Or as I mentioned, you can link racks and they can have one dosing and monitoring system. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the difference between dosing and monitoring. So you can have dosing can have monitoring or you can have both. So let's say you have only dosing. What that means is that you have controllers and you can see the controllers here. You have probes that go into your system water and it reads the levels of the pH and salinity. And when it breaches whatever parameters you have set, it the controllers turn on the pumps and it doses the salt and the sodium bicarbonate automatically. So it can do that, it can go about its business and you would actually have to be there in the lab um, to see the levels and make sure that everything was actually working. Um, if you add a monitoring system to that, it means that you are getting the readout from afar, from your laptop or from wherever you may be. So if you are monitoring it as well, it can also send alarms to you. Um, alternatively, let's say you don't want to uh, automatically dose, but you do want to monitor. So you can have the probes in your system and the controllers and the alarms, you just don't have these pumps and barrels to automatically send the salt and sodium bicarb. Uh, it's a matter of budget, it's a matter of what you need. Uh, and so, you know, we can do any combination of those things depending on what you need. Water out. So this is a big one. Uh, one thing when people are looking at spaces uh, for aquatic labs, they don't think about enough is floor drains. And when I say, does the space have a floor drain to someone I'm working with uh, for a new system, the, the, oftentimes they'll say, yes, it has a floor drain. And, and what they mean is it has a sink. And that sink has a drain that goes off somewhere and they're not sure where. And that's not what we mean by floor drain. Um, I think most of you know, but it's so important. You can see here, there's like a typical floor drain for if we were going to run overflow water to that, we would just cut a little hole there and, and run the tube down there. Um, for larger systems with more flow and overflow, you would need a, a floor sink, which can collect a little bit of the water before it heads down the drain. Some facilities have trench drains, which are very helpful because uh, it gives a lot of space for you to sweep water that may have spilled on the floor into it, it makes it very convenient for wherever your equipment is you can route it to the trench you don't want to have your system drain in the middle of the space 
So often if someone is designing a lab, let's say it's an architect or a lab designer and they haven't worked with aquatics, to them it makes sense to put a floor drain in the middle. But that means you're going to have to run your overflow, your drain line from your system across the floor. And that's a trip hazard and it takes up space. You can't get your carts around it. So when you're first working with your designers, make sure they realize that you, if you put a floor drain in the middle of the space, that's fine. But you need one very close to the equipment so that you can run your drain directly to it and not interfere with the workflow. Um, I was going to say something. What was it? I think my mind just went blank, but one, one thing I do know is that, you know, if you need the drain to be in the floor. So I've had some people who, who provide a drain that it kind of sticks up from the floor and, and has a, a, a catch tray, tray, and that is just not ideal. Um, you really do want it in the floor. If you can't, if you absolutely cannot bring a floor drain into the space. And this has happened even with large systems. We can provide an overflow sump and then a pump to send the water to the nearest drain location, like a sink or something like that. Um, it's just It just adds more ways for maybe water to overflow into the floor. So it's, it's definitely not recommended. Oh, I know what I was going to say. One more thing, the slope. Um, yeah, definitely remember that you want huh, you want the floor to slope towards the drain. You, you know, you don't want the drain to be at a high point on the floor. And you'd be surprised how many times that this isn't taken into consideration. So we've talked a little bit about the incoming water. You, you have just some utility requirements that you need to be aware of. Um, so electrical specifications, you definitely want to have splash covers on your electrical outlets. Um, you want them to be installed above the floor. It's not a good idea to have them low to the ground. Like I'm looking here, you know, I have some electrical outlets here in my office that are maybe you know, six inches above the floor. And that's not a good idea. Just as I said before, in case there's some kind of a water incident, you want the electrical outlets to be up maybe 42, 48 inches off the finished floor. You are definitely going to need dedicated circuits for especially your life support equipment, but also for other parts of your equipment. And what that means is there's a difference between a circuit and an outlet. So you might have two sets of outlets uh, in your space and, and think, okay, I've got two circuits, but they might be on the same circuit. And anyone who has you know, started a hairdryer when everyone was using something at the same time and it, and it blows your circuits knows what I mean. Uh, you really need to make sure you have the required number of circuits and then have the outlets that go with them. Uh, emergency backup power for your life support system, which is certainly your pumps, um, is is recommended. It's basically very important to have that. Uh, there, a lot of places have intermittent electrical tests where they the electrical goes off for 30 seconds or something like that. And and if you don't have this emergency backup power, it's going to shut your system down for that period of time. And um, sometimes it can have issues starting up again. So especially for the life support systems, which is the pumps, you, you want to have emergency backup power. It's good to have it for your monitoring system as well so that you actually know that something has happened when it happens. HVAC, briefly, we can say that um, you're going to set your room temperature a couple of degrees below the desired water temperature. So typically, um, for a standalone rack, it comes with a heater because we figure if you just have one rack, you're not going to make that whole room 28 degrees C. It, it just isn't good for people. Uh, so we figure, you know, you're going to need a heater for that rack. But for large systems, we typically recommend that the room temperature is what sets the water temperature. Uh, if you have a heater, it would be only as a backup. That cuts down a lot on condensation um, and even energy use because those heaters have to work really hard if there's a, a large gap between the room temperature and the water temperature. Um, but also the equipment itself adds a little bit to the, to the temperature and that's why you set the room temperature a couple of degrees below. 
ventilation, eight to 10 room exchanges per hour. This is something that we don't actually provide. Of course, this would be your HVAC contractor, but this is what we would recommend. And then aim for less than 50% humidity. Actually, as little as possible, we don't need humidity, just the fish, and they're at 100%. So um, get as little humidity in the room, basically, as you can. Talked a little bit about monitoring. And so, you know, you're going to need an RJ45 connection. You're going to need a dedicated IP address. This is something that uh, frequently people think they have it. And then when we get there and install the monitoring system, they don't. We try and work in advance with the IT people on site and, and get everything prepared before we come because there's also things like um, fi institutional firewalls. So even if there's a dedicated IP address and we get there and install the monitoring, uh, sometimes it can't send out the alarms that it needs because there is this um, uh, firewall, the institutional firewall. So these are all things to look into before we show up and try and get the system running. Um, it's very good to have this kind of automatic monitoring because a lot, a lot of places now are requiring, like your IACUC and other regulatory uh, agencies are requiring certain amounts of record keeping, of course, and you can do it manually. You can have a, an Excel spreadsheet, but if you have a monitoring system such as this, it backs up the data and keeps it for a period of time. It, it makes it a lot easier to access. It makes it easier to actually look at trends. It can provide you charts and graphs and you can see, oh, you know, every four days, my pH spikes. I wonder why that is. So it can be very beneficial. Um, but as I mentioned before, when we were talking about dosing and monitoring, it is optional. Lighting specifications, um, you definitely want to place the lighting between the rows of racks. Uh, there really hasn't been any agreement yet on what level of lighting or what spectrum of lighting is best for fish. There's been there's some work being done on that now. Uh, I think most places just still have fluorescent lighting. Some are changing to LED, but you can see that if you have a light going directly over the rack, it's going to do a lot more algae will grow there. Um, not that the algae is necessarily harmful, but it does mean you won't be able to see the fish very well. You'll have to clean the tanks more often. So the light placement is important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the light level, uh, lower light levels do reduce algae growth. On the other hand, if you have a situation where you have lights up in the ceiling here, between the rows of racks. And you can see that you're going to have less light at the bottom rows of racks. And that actually can make a difference in the behavior of the fish. It might even make a difference in the health of the fish. So some people are looking into a way to extend the light down, like a different kind of lighting system to equalize the amount of light to all of the tanks on the system. And of course, uh, dawn to dusk setting is better. That's where the lights slowly come on in the morning and, and slowly go off in the evening for your photo period. Fish do startle when the lights go on. I'm sure they get used to it, but um, if you can imitate the natural dawn to dusk of the real world, then that's, that's a plus. If you have a need for different lighting scenarios, let's say you're doing sleep studies or let's say you need a bunch of embryos throughout the day so that you couldn't have the lights go on and everyone spawn at once. You want to be able to, like for instance, for this row, you would spawn at 9 a.m. and then use those embryos. And then at this row, you would spawn at 11 a.m., et cetera. There are ways to do that. So there's light hoods, which is this. It encompasses the whole rack and you close the door and it has its own light cycle on the inside. Um, and then these are light boxes. And as I mentioned, you can actually have each one set for a different light cycle for whatever your need may be. And then you can also have um, light blocking panels. For instance, uh, above each shelf, you can have a light blocking panel that can help protect the fish from the light. I do want to say one thing I always like to talk about. I don't have a slide for it today, but there was this really great talk um, given at one of our zebrafish husbandry workshops a while ago where it was um, at Children's Boston, I believe, and, or no, at Harvard. And uh, they have a lot of 
fish, a lot of racks. And there was one rat that consistently the fish were not breeding and they just couldn't figure out why they were being fed the same, you know, everything was the same. And with a lot of detective work, they figured out that that rat was right by the red exit light and the exit light was on all night. And those fish just never got their correct light cycle and, and they just weren't breeding as well. So uh, it's good to maybe use a green exit light if you have to have one in your facility and just be aware that even small things like, um, you know, computer lights or things that are left on near the fish, Artemia hatchers, if you have them in the same room, can re really do some damage to the ability of your fish to breed. So yeah, so you have electrical services and HVAC, plumbing and floor drains, water supply, data ports, um, floor reinforcement, a couple of other things that some people need to worry about here in California. We definitely do seismic bracing. Um, so it depends on the facility. Some facilities require that the seismic be stamped by an official, you know, mechanical engineer. Uh, Aquaneering, we have a number of standard ways that we uh, connect our racks to the structure and we can present those and then if, you know sometimes the facility can just accept that and but then sometimes as i said it has to go out to engineering so that's something to know in advance because that is a big expense tens tens of thousands of dollars depending on the size of your facility to get uh, a, a certified engineer to, to stamp off on on the plan so if you have any um, thought that you're going to have to have bracing, look into whether it's okay just to have, you know, the contractor or manufacturer recommended bracing, or if you have to have it stamped. And then effluent treatment, uh, especially in Canada, this is a big deal right now. Uh, I think most facilities have to have some type of effluent treatment of their outgoing water. Uh, Europe, I think, is also uh, becoming more aware of like the effluent treatment and we've had to provide a number of systems there too. It's, it's less of a problem in the US actually here. It only seems to be an issue when there's some kind of like disease uh, or, you know, radiation um, research going on so that you really do have to protect the outside world from the effluent. Uh, but look into whether it's something that you require. There's a lot of different ways to do it. There's, you know, heat, chemical. Uh, so whatever the requirements are for your facility, we can do it. But it does take space as well. You have to have uh, some kind of um, a sump to collect the outgoing water and treat it and then a way to, to get it to drain. So it, you definitely need to know in advance. It's hard to fit one in after the fact. Operating costs, they're, they're minimal, but they are ongoing. Um, things like your salt, your sodium bicarb, your food, your test strips, um, you know, for like a small couple of standalone racks, with dosing and monitoring, you're looking at maybe a thousand dollars a year. So it's not a huge amount of money, but um, you know, when you, it, it, it's ongoing, you need to think about it. You need to prepare for it and you need to have storage space for it. So that is basically the end of this part of my talk of basically the talk um, Aquaneering uh, can help you with your facility requirements and planning installation, maintenance and repair, and upgrades. But I do want to also let you know that there are several resources for zebrafish people. On our website, we have um, these recordings that have been made by all of these organizations. Uh, they all have really good help for zebrafish. They're very interesting recordings. So I, I um, encourage you to go to our website and look at these uh, recordings by these organizations. And if there are some of them you're not familiar with, um, like there were some I didn't know uh, anything about, and I learned a lot. So that's one resource for you. Aquaneering also has a webinar series called Deep Dive. Uh, we just started it after having an ongoing through the uh, through the COVID uh years, we had um, a monthly uh, then and now webinar series. Now it's every other month called the Deep Dive. Last last one was Dr. Kate Whitlock talking about sustainability. That was really interesting. And our next one is going to be Tuesday, November 8th 
um, where Zoltan Varga and Evan Lukes from Zerk are going to talk about successfully shipping and receiving live fish. Um, it may seem like that's not a very big deal, but there's a lot to it. And they're going to go into it in detail and, and help it be successful if you need to send them something or receive something from them. And then finally, the husbandry workshop that Aquanering has been doing, this is going to be our 19th annual. We hold it in conjunction with the Aquaculture America meeting because when we started 19 years ago, there weren't very many groups working with zebrafish and, and Aquaculture America is all about fish. So it, it, it was a good match and it's remained a good match for many years. We have two full days of talks um, on everything under the sun and we will have some of the talks available as video on demand for those of you who are either overseas or don't have the budget to attend. Uh, so we hope to see you there. And if you have any questions at all, I would be more than happy to answer them now, or there's my email address, my phone, and I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Bobby, for your presentation. It was very nice and very informative. I mean, that's a concern of all researchers. We need this space, and we all want that um, good space and good structure for our experiments to keep our faith, our fish safe. <laughs> we all have budget concerns, of course, but yeah. it was very nice. Um, let's see if you have questions. For now, no questions on the YouTube. I do have one question, more curiosity. Do, uh, do you have uh, products for uh, focusing, I mean, in welfare, I mean, in environmental enrichment, for example? Yes. Um, so Aquaneering has, I could go grab it. We have the um, some little inserts that go under our tanks so they don't go in the water. They sit under our tanks and provide the look of, you know, pebbles on, under the fish. Um, live feed is considered enrichment. So anyone who's using live feed, that automatically counts. Um, and actually in our workshop, we're going to have a big discussion of enrichment. I know this is, it's now a requirement in many labs. And the question is, what is it and what works best? So, so we have the under rack, I mean, I'm sorry, the under tank inserts. I know people use all different kinds of things. They, they use like little half, you know, tubing, like uh, PVC pipe. Uh, they use little plants. There's all kinds of things that different labs use. There's no standardization whatsoever. And, and there's been a lot of studies actually on uh, enrichment and discussions about what works best, but it hasn't kind of made its way into any kind of standard practice. Yes, that's true. I mean, it has been discussed. Uh, uh, there are papers and studies for a while now, but yeah, there is no... Uh, decision on it. I mean, as you said, there are a lot of different things being used. I have right. just another quick question. <laughs> it's just, um, what about uh, noise? We know that uh, these installations can be very noisy, the filtration systems. You present something about lighting. I know that also about noise, there's nothing, uh, um, there are not a, a standard uh, procedural knowledge about it, but do you know about any upcoming technology like trying to reduce noise inside the labs that you know, can, can affect fish behavior or something? So there's a couple of things on noise. So one of them is, so for instance, um, if you have your filtration system in another room, basically the only noise you have in the housing room is the rushing of the water. And I, I don't see any way to get rid of that. Uh, but if you have your filtration system in your housing room, you can put um, a sound enclosure around your pumps, which we do. And uh, there, there's also ways to reduce vibration. Like you can put pads if that's an issue. Um, it, it, it depends on how close everything is to each other. Uh, and so that's one side of it is the noise that we hear in the room and how, how to mitigate that and the vibration which the fish can feel. But the other question is, what did the fish hear? And we had a really, really wonderful keynote speaker at one of our workshops eight years ago or so. Um, and he talked about how to fish here and what did they hear. 
And so that's something that should be taken into consideration. It's not just, oh, we hear the pumps. It's do the fish even hear the pumps? What does hearing even mean to a fish? Um, I do think it's more vibration, but but they can hear things obviously because let's say there's a loud noise and you see them startle. So um, I think that's a very, very interesting topic. Uh, we've also had a guy from Turner Instruments come and talk for us before, and he talks about measuring noise and vibration. So it's it's very interesting to me. Uh, again, I don't have too many like set answers about this is how much noise fish can handle, and this is what they hear, and this is the level of, of vibration that, that should be. Um, again, it's, it's growing. People need to do more research on it, for sure. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so yeah, we don't have any other questions. I will thank you again. It was a very nice presentation. So thank you for sharing with us all the knowledge of the products that Aconirim has to offer. So thank you. Yeah, thank it you. was my pleasure. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, so we are going now to our next presentation, uh, the last one of this morning. And I'm here to present Dr. Susana. Dr. Susana Loreiro, are you there? Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, well, Hello. Dr. Susana Loreiro is a biologist and she currently works as a professor and a researcher at the Center for Environmental and Marine Studies of Aveiro, Portugal. Um, her research interests are mainly in the areas of ecotoxicology, nano-ecotoxicology, and fate, chemical mixture prediction, combined stress, and environmental, environmental circularity. And she's here today to talk a bit about the effects of emergent chemical substances and their mixtures in zebrafish. So enjoy. Uh, enjoy her presentation and please feel free to uh, send your questions at the comments in the YouTube. And we will 
get back to the questions right after her presentation. So welcome, Dr. Susana Loreiro, and please, uh, you can start your speech whenever you want. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all see uh, my presentation now. Um, so I will be talking about the effects of emergent chemical substances and especially on their mixtures in zebrafish, uh, looking at an environmental perspective and how we can use uh, zebrafish uh, in this context. So within uh, environmental perspective, we look at uh, similar trends uh, as human uh, toxicologists look at but also at different trends. So here you can see, for instance, on the left side uh, of the screen, uh, some schemes and pictures of the fish uh, development test. Uh, so how we approach the, their development uh, during the embryo stage uh, and how we uh, approach these into a, a perspective of a non-animal uh, test method but also uh, looking at uh, different levels of biological organization, looking from the molecular part, uh, passing through the cells, the organs, look at the individual traits, like for instance, um, their behavior, and then uh, transposing that into the population, the community, their interaction with other uh, organisms, and uh, finally, uh, looking at effects at the ecosystem, namely at the ecosystem services. Uh, in a different perspective from the human health uh, and toxicology, uh, we look at uh, how these uh, zebrafish species can be used as a proxy for other uh, freshwater species uh, and how they can uh, be uh, a proxy for uh, inferon effects that substances can have uh, on um, similar types of fish. Within these, and looking again at similarities with human health, uh, we look nowadays at adverse outcome pathways, so linking all these uh, levels of organization to define what is the key initiating event of a chemical substance, and then driving the pathway until the organism, and then uh, transposing that to the ecosystem scenario. So now uh, making here a gap on uh, zebrafish and the specificities of zebrafish and as I'm talking about mixture toxicity and how we can predict what happens when we have more than one chemical substance in the environment. Uh, I will show you how we do this and how we approach uh, mixtures in the environment. So we can go through two different ways. Uh, we can go from a diagnostic approach or we can go for a prognostic approach. So if we look at this top-down approach for the diagnosis, we usually focus on a case study. These are usually related with monitoring activities. They are uh, quite site-specific and we perform a retrospective approach. So uh, we can analyze the mixture as a whole uh, in a bioassay. So we just expose, for instance, fish to um, some water that was sampled for, from a case study, and then we can discriminate and identify uh, specific chemicals for uh, toxicity effects. And we can use effect-directed analysis, we can use the toxicity identification evaluation through several techniques. Usually they are uh, chemistry techniques that can depict and extract certain chemicals uh, and then after retesting the mixture, we can predict what will be um, the effects that were generated by that specific chemical. On the other side, we have a prognostic approach, a bottom-up approach, that's uh, mainly what I'll be talking about here today, which looks at first the individual substances to predict uh, mixture toxicity. So this is a strategy based on a chemical mode of action. So first, our first approach is uh, to try to define what is the mode of action to then establish our strategy uh, and uh, do a prediction of the mixture toxicity. So in a diagnostic approach and going very fast on this, 
mainly what we have is that we have a complex mixture, we can run a bioassay, and then we start fractioning this complex mixture. So we start to extract chemicals from this mixture and we retest it again with the bioassay. So the difference between results within these two bioassays um, will depict the effect related to the chemical that was removed from this fractioning uh, approach. Uh, we can also run chemical analysis to see uh, if we don't know exactly what was fractioned to, to understand what was the fraction that was removed. And we can say that that contaminant is the responsible for a specific effect or a specific percentage effect. So this can also be run through a direct uh, analysis, an effect direct analysis, and uh, related it directly with their position in the adverse outcome pathway. So we can do this uh, fractionation and see in which part of the, the AOP uh, the chemical would have um, a more relevance, let's say, and try to predict what will be the, the, the process where the chemical was really interacting with the biological target. So in the prognostic approach, so this is more uh, looking at the future, we do uh, a mechanistic uh, ecotoxicological approach to the pit mixture toxicity. So first what we do is that we look uh, carefully at the toxicity of individual levels, especially looking at their those response curve. Uh, we try to infer on their mode of action. So this is something uh, that I will talk a little bit further in the next slides. And we can also start to think about an assumptions on the interaction that can occur between chemicals. So this interaction uh, must be uh, clarified that is interaction inside the organism. So something related with toxicodynamics, not under the exposure scenario. Uh, then we look at mathematical problems that can uh, describe interactions if they occur. And we start to design our uh, test experiment, looking at all the assumptions that we defined throughout uh, all these parameters. So about the modes of action, uh, it's widely known that different uh, substances have different modes of actions. They can have several modes of actions. Here I just give some examples for metals and also for organic chemicals. And usually they are very well defined for their target uh, organism. So if we know that an insecticide uh, is uh, developed exactly to affect, for instance, the acetylcholine strays in one specific process of a specific uh, insect. So, but this kind of approaches changes a little bit when uh, we look at non-target species. So here is an example of an insecticide that was developed to block the acetylcholine receptor site. So uh, mainly it will inhibit the nervous system, the central nervous system of aphids, which are uh, some pests for some, some plants. And with these, they uh, will be killed and uh, prevent the plant to have uh, deleterious effects. Uh, on the other side, we can have an herbicide so herbicide uh, target sites are very widely known. Uh, for instance, some of them will uh, affect the biosynthesis of chlorophyll, some uh, the amino acid biosynthesis, uh, electron transport during the photosynthesis or uh, impairment of the carotenoid production. So if we look at this, it's very clear how an insecticide is created, how an herbicide is created, especially devoted to a mode of action and to certain targets. But if we change this a little bit, and if we look at the herbicide and the zebrafish, we cannot say that the herbicide will impair the photosynthesis of a zebrafish. So we know the mode of action, the primary mode of action for the target species, so for the plant that was a pest, but we don't know how the herbicide will affect our zebrafish. 
And the same for plants. If we expose a non-target plant to an insecticide, then we don't know what the insecticide will do to the plant because the plant doesn't have a nervous system and usually insecticides act upon the nervous system. So this is something tricky and this is something that usually we can try to transpose if we are talking about transposing a mode of action from an animal to another one, but it changes a little bit if we want to, to look at mode of action that was primarily um, depicted for a plant and now we want to uh, extrapolate it for an animal and the other way around also. So the, this, as this is the, the principle of pharmacology, the mode of action and how chemicals interact with the, the target site. Um, all these interactions between chemicals and how they behave when jointly exposed to a, a biological target was uh, studied a long, long time ago in the last century, in the early last century, uh, under a pharmacological approach. And nowadays we use exactly the same mathematical models to try to infer and predict what will be the mixture uh, effects uh, in the environment. So two main uh, conceptual models were described. The first one in 1926, by Love and Mushnik, uh, and they uh, were based on chemicals having the same mode of action. So in this case, it was quite simple. So um, these two uh, scientists just uh, look at chemicals with the same mode of action as acting as a dilution of themselves, um, because mainly they would uh, have the, a similar biological pathway and they were acting at the same molecular target. So it was like they were the same uh, and could be concentrated or diluted depending on their concentration in the mixture. So this is uh, mathematically very simple. Uh, this is based on the toxic unit approach. So mainly the toxic unit uh, can define the strength of a concentration uh, into a target. And if you have uh, a concentration that you want to predict uh, the effect, you just divide it by the EC50, which is the effective concentration for 50% of your endpoint or any other percentage that you want to work with. And you will understand uh, how will be the strength of your chemical. So this means if your concentration is equal to the EC50, then you have a toxic unit of one, and you know that that concentration will induce an effect of 50% of inhibition, for instance, or stimulation of your endpoint. On the other side, if it's half of your EC50, this concentration is half, you will know that the effect will estimated will be like 25%. So with this, you can sum the toxic units of different chemicals and try to predict their effect. So this is what I usually say, that it's better to use a sum of things that have the same unit. In this case, they don't have any unit, they are unitless. Uh, rather than summing uh, apples and pears, so or summing zinc and cadmium, so then you have a milligram per liter, but you know don't know what the milligram is about. So this is a way of surpassing and overpassing this kind of uh, approaches and understanding and trying to predict what will be the the strength of your mixture. So in this kind of um, approaches for the concentration addition, we usually use isobolograms to uh, look at uh, mixtures and to use the toxic unit approach. So imagine if we have two concentrations, one of chemical one and the other one of chemical two, and we uh, know exactly where is the EC50. So we know that this is equivalent to one toxic unit. This is equivalent to another toxic unit. So this means that in this case, if you have uh, a dot on top of this line, you have zero of chemical two, and you have the equivalent of one toxic unit of chemical one. So if you just drop a line between these two dots, it means that 
all the combinations between chemical one and chemical two in terms of concentrations lying on top of this uh, line will have an effect of 50% because it will be equivalent to your EC50, so equivalent to one toxic unit. And you can do several combinations of this. You can have 0.5 toxic units of one chemical and 0.5 of the other chemical, or you can have more than one chemical and less than another one, but your prediction is always that it will produce an effect of 50%, so equal to one toxic unit. So you can have several of these lines that will cross uh, chemical two and chemical one concentrations. You know they, they will be equivalent to a certain amount of toxic unit, and you can generate several combinations and you can predict what will be the effect of that mixture. So uh, behaving within the concentration addition model is known that each chemical will contribute to the toxicity of the mixture. They, they act, as I told you before, as a, a dilution of each other, and you can use concentrations which are predicted to induce no effect. So you can use no egg values or no observed effect concentration values, or you can even use EC0, so the concentration that you predict that will have no effect. Uh, you can use uh, many chemicals at low concentration and they can still uh, produce uh, some toxicity because you will sum uh, zero for some or 2% of, uh, for, for other chemical, but at the end, if you have 10 chemicals inducing 2% of uh, effect, at the end of the mixture, you will have 20% of effect. And this is something more significant than have 2%. So uh, then we have another conceptual model that is a little bit different from the concentration addition model, but still it is considered an additivity model. So in the concentration addition model, we have a, a, a sum of toxic units that will then reflect to a sum of effects. But in the independent action model, uh, we assume that uh, chemicals in a mixture act independently of each other uh, and they will have different modes of action. So we know that they will uh, act at different targets and they will have a sum in their response. So we don't um, sum the toxic units to predict the organism response, but it's more a question of prob probability of occurring effects or in a better way uh, the, the probability of occurring no effects because the effect of one chemical can only be predicted from the response where there was no effect from the other chemical. This mathematically is a little bit more complex um, and uh, is based on joint probabilities so instead of having uh, a sum, we have a multiplication of unaffected fractions, mainly because uh, your total response from the mixture will be something like a sum of responses, and each of them cannot be a repetition from the other one. So uh, mathematically is more complicated, is more complex, but uh, is doable and is feasible. So it just needs a little bit more of mathematical skills, let's say. Uh, so the consequences of independent action model are a little bit uh, different because in this case, you will always need a full dose response curve for each individual chemical uh, that you are using in the mixture. Uh, and uh, you require a careful selection of the best fit in those response models. So you cannot just say that usually I use this prediction and I will lose always this equation no matter uh, what my, my raw data is. So this is something that uh, you need to be careful when you are using the independent action model. Uh, another thing that differs from the concentration addition model is that chemicals that do not contribute to the toxicity of the mixture concentration below the EC0 cannot be used. 
So in this case, uh, is just a, a mathematical issue because every time you have a zero of response, if you multiply something by zero, you get zero. So, uh, uh, and on the other side, in the concentration addition model, if you have a zero on a sum, nothing happens. So everything will stay the same and you don't just uh, get your response completely new. So, uh, talking about null and the, the null hypothesis for this mixture toxicity approach is simply that the concentration addition is used when the same mode of action occurs and the dependent action when the, you have different modes of action and you use the specific equation. So, the null hypothesis here for mixture toxicity when you run the concentration addition, now using this as, as, as an easiest example to, to understand, is that your null hypothesis say that the concentration addition model can predict the toxicity of your mixture. So this is true, and where there is no biological interactions between chemicals, but in another way, it's also very different to approach when you don't know your model species and you don't know the mode of action for your specific model species. So this is tricky because then you cannot decide in which one to choose, if you choose mathematically the concentration addition or the independent action. Uh, this is useful when you know the mode of action, but if you don't know, it's somehow tricky. So then when you are testing your null hypothesis for concentration addition or independent action, if uh, your null hypothesis is dismissed, so this means that somehow there is a biological interaction and you have to look for this biological interaction. So what determines the interaction of chemicals in a mixture was already described through also the pharmacological approach a long time ago. And mainly this interaction, as I told you before, is defined of something occurring inside the organism, not outside the organism. So if by any chance there is an inter a chemical interaction between your, chemical, your chemicals in a mixture during the exposure, so this means that you cannot use uh, these conceptual models. Um, your, your chemicals have to be stable during the exposure so that there is no interaction and uh, otherwise you cannot use this mathematical approach. So when we talk about mixture interaction, this happens under a toxicodynamic uh, approach. So if we have chemical A and chemical B again, we say that they interact if the presence of one of the chemicals will influence the amount of the other chemical reaching the target site of action or the presence of one of the chemicals changes what uh, the second chemical will produce uh, during uh, the, the site of action or of course reversally with A and B uh, in this case interchanged. So I will show you two possible deviations from the null hypothesis. So mainly is when one of the chemical is toxic and the other chemical is not toxic. So this sometimes happens. And when this happens and your concentration addition is the model that justifies your prediction, you will have in your isobolograms a line. So you will have a horizontal line. But then if there are interactions and your null hypothesis is dismissed, you can have a synergism. So in this case, you will have uh, something also called as a potentiation because one of the chemicals is not toxic, but is potentiating the toxicity effect of the other one. But you can also have the other way around. You can uh, also uh, uh, an antagonistic effect, meaning that the chemical that was not toxic just decreases the toxicity of the chemical that you seen before that was toxic. So uh, with this approach, when one chemical is toxic and the other chemical is not toxic, we can use um, a mathematical equation uh, for the synergistic ratios. 
which divides uh, the EC50s of chemical uh, one, so the one that is toxic, and the EC50s of the mixture where you have chemical uh, one and chemical two. So uh, now I will present you an example uh, where we use this synergistic ratio approach uh, using the zebrafish danureri uh, and within um, a mixture of atrazine and terbutilazine on clorpyrifos tox toxicity. So in this case, we uh, have already tested the toxicity for chlorpyrifos, which is an insecticide, and it was extremely toxic to the zebrafish. But then we knew that atrazine and terbutilazine was not toxic under the concentrations that we used. So we would like to see if combining corpyrifus with any of these herbicides would uh, maintain the toxicity of corpyrifus under the, concentra the concentration addition or the independent action model because we didn't know the mode of action of atrazine and terbutalazine on corpyrifus toxicity and on zebrafish toxicity, sorry, um, or if it would change the toxicity of corpyrifus. So, uh, in, in this approach, we uh, use the fish embryo development test. First, we test each of the chemicals individually. We uh, discussed a little bit what will be their mode of action. So, we knew that the Clarkleafus acts under the steel clean stress activity. So, we were predicting neurotoxicity. But regarding the mode of action of the herbicides, we were not sure. Uh, so, uh, what we did was running the, the zebrafish embryo test and calculating the ratios of synergy, so the synergistic ratios. So, in this table, just to show you and guide you for some numbers, uh, what we did was we calculate the EC50 values always for uh, chlorpyrifus and their different concentrations of atrazine and terbutilazine. So, uh, uh, we calculated the EC50 for chlorpyrifus always, and then we calculated the synergistic ratio just by dividing the uh, EC50 under no atrazine or no terbutilazine uh, exposure, and at each of these uh, concentrations of each herbicide. So, first, what we saw was that uh, Chlorpyrifus had an uh, EC50 of 0.71 milligrams per liter, but when we uh, put them uh, exposure under a mixture with atrazine, we just saw that as we increase the concentration of atrazine, the EC50 for Chlorpyrifus decreased until 0.06. So by calculating the synergistic ratio, we had almost 12 in the highest concentration and we even had uh, around 24 for the synergistic ratio uh, meaning that when combined with atrazine the toxicity of, of chlorpyrifos increased between uh, 12 and 24 times so the same was done for terbutilazine and we also saw this increase in toxicity so these, we started with a similar value, so 0.61, and we ended up with 0.05 uh, as an EC50 of corpus when exposed simultaneously with terbutilazine. So again, we also find the same synergistic ratios indicated that, um, and we know, and it was established as a limit of 10, that if you have a synergistic ratio higher than 10, uh, uh, this uh, interaction or potentiation is of extreme importance. So, uh, when both chemicals are toxic, uh, then we can uh, look at things in a different perspective. So, we can have something uh, like this. So, if you remember, um, this uh, black line here is from additivity, so if you uh, imagine this A and this B is a toxic unit, you can have here uh, the, all the, the combinations will uh, be here depicted as the same toxicity. But on the other side, if we have a curve bending inwards in the graph, 
uh, this means that you have an effect greater than these those activities. So this means that by having the same mixture, or, or excuse me, for by having a, a lower level mixture, you will have exactly the same toxicity as if you was predicted by the additivity model. So this means that uh, you will have an increase in toxicity rather than the expected one by uh, what you inferred from the single chemical toxicity. Then if you have the other way around, you can have less than the dose additive scenarios, uh, which are depicted here in green lines with these being more extreme. So this means that for you to have the same um, toxicity that was predicted here by additivity, you need to have higher doses of both of your chemicals. Then we have other uh, types of responses uh, where the effects are not produced by any dose of either chemical alone. So this is running a little bit off the uh, additivity and other explained uh, deviations. Uh, on the other side, if we have uh, straight horizontal or vertical lines, like I showed you before, chemicals A and B act independently and uh, they are not dependent from each other. So they will be uh, possibly non-toxic, one of them, and uh, they are not interfering with the toxicity of the other one. So now I will present you some uh, chemical mixture and combined detect case studies. Uh, with Daniel Herio, using this approach that I showed you where both chemicals or stressors will induce some toxicity to zebrafish. So the first one is from a, a European project called Water Needs Availability, Quality and Sustainability, uh, the We Need project, uh, whose ob objective was mainly to study the potential uh, deleterious effects of emergent mixtures, so using emergent chemicals, and use this information in the risk assessment and prediction of groundwater pollution. So this was a, a, used as an approach for both ecosystems and uh, human health based on the One Health uh, approach. And one of the best uh, models to use when you, you want to look at the ecosystem and the human health is the zebrafish model. So uh, what we did was that we have a case study from two Italian aquifers of Cremona and Bologna. And we knew the constitutions of these two waters. So we simulated the groundwaters in the lab. And we tried to test and look at differences in toxicities when we did, had different waters. So mainly what we did was that we uh, use three chemical compounds as emergent uh, chemicals to uh, study uh, potential uh, effects. So we use acetaminophen, we use triclosan, and we use PFOS uh, to look at their uh, toxicity. So again, we use the fish embryo uh, test. Uh, and here you can see, for instance, um, this is a control uh, larvae, and then some malformations that we found while we used the zebrafish water from the, the, the zebrafish system, like you saw in the last presentation, where we have a tail malformation under PFOS exposure. But also under the Cremona uh, water with PFOS, we got besides the tail malformation, we got, also got cardiac edema. And in the Bologna with PFOS, we have other types of um, malformations, namely an inflated bladder. So the other thing that we saw, uh, and it was not uh, chemical specific, uh, so, but it was, sorry, it was chemical specific because it didn't show any trend, was that the toxicity of the emergent chemicals was different uh, depending on the water. So this is something typical when we are dealing with, with metals, but not so typically when we are dealing with organic uh, compounds. So in this case, for instance, PFOS was much more toxic in the Bologna uh, 
uh, water than in the, the fish system water or in the Cremona water. But um, on the other side, for triclosan, for instance, um, there was a different pattern. In addition, we saw also, uh, and we could infer on the potency of each chemical, and uh, we saw that acetaminophen was the less, the less toxic to zebrafish, while the PFOS was the, the one presenting the higher toxicity. So then after doing this exercise, and although we didn't know the, the exact mode of action of uh, each of the chemicals, we try to use the concentration addition model uh, as the simplest model and the more conservative model uh, to predict the toxicity of uh, PFOS and um, triclosan and acetaminophen. So we use all the combinations of the chemicals, but here I will present you some uh, examples. So this example, uh, I'm showing you the isobolograms of uh, the chemical mixture of triclosan and PFOS. Um, and uh, these will show you as a parameter the mortality of the neuherio embryos or larvae for a 96 hour exposure. So each of these lines is a isobol, and in here, what you can see as a number is the percentage or the, the mortality or the survival that occurred in the, the the toxicity tests. So in this case, what we have is survival because in this line at lower concentrations, you have a prediction of 80% of survival, while in this here with higher concentrations, you will get 20% of survival. And in this case here, in this scenario where we have increased of PFOS and some triclos, and we have 0% of survival and the same for the other ones. So just to show you first what usually look like the isobolograms for modeling, um, as I showed you before, the additivity is a straight line, like you see here. And then for synergies, we usually have the lines transformed into curves. And then they can bend in or bend out. So this one bending in is uh, synergism, if it bends out is antagonism. But then we can have a combination of antagonism and synergism that they can be dependent on the dose or on the concentration of the um, both chemicals present. So in this case here, we have a dose ratio approach where you have a pattern of synergism when you have high concentrations of toxic two and low concentrations of toxic one, but then it will turn to antagonism when you have the other way around. Uh, in the dose level response, we have antagonism where when uh, both, the, both chemicals are present in low concentrations and then change into synergism as you increase the concentrations or the levels of both chemicals. So in this specific case, we look at the fish system water, the Cremona synthetic water, and the Bologna synthetic water. And we see that the patterns are quite different. So while we could predict the toxicity of the mixture of PFOS and triclosan by the concentration addition model in the fish water system, an antagonistic pattern was observed uh, in the Cremona synthetic water. So this bending out of the curve means that uh, the, there is an antagonism and it, which was supported by statistics done. Uh, on the other side, in the Bologna synthetic water here on the right, you see an antagonistic um, effect when uh, you have um, low doses of PFOS and increased doses of triclosan. But then when you change the, the concentrations, that then you get a synergistic effect of uh, both chemicals. So, sorry. so this, this shows that uh, different scenarios can uh, help you to predict different toxicities, which was something that we were not expected, considering that both uh, Cremona and Bologna waters were 
perfectly well for maintaining the zebrafish embryos, so no differences in controls were perceived. But in addition, they were changing the toxicity of the chemicals by themselves, but also on their mixtures, causing different patterns of responses. But we can also have the same approach when we combine chemicals with um, abiotic stressors. So abiotic stressors like temperature, like UV radiation, uh, oxygen, dissolved oxygen in water. So in this case, I will show you how we did an exposure test and how we predict the, the toxicity effects of uh, Daniel Herio exposed to zinc oxide nanoparticles under UV radiation or with no UV radiation. So mainly zinc oxide nanoparticles can be present in, uh, in UV filters. So we know that there is an interaction between the particles and UV radiation. So we would like to explore a little bit how these behaves uh, with, with uh, Daniel Herio, but also we did the same with Daphne, although here I will show you just the Daniel Herio experiment. So our uh, hypothesis is that um, the UV radiation would have some changes in zinc oxide nanoparticles and that zinc oxide nanoparticles could act like a protection from UV radiation into zebrafish embryos, mainly because we expect that uh, embryos in sometimes are um, under shallow waters, so they can perceive more UV radiation than uh, adult fish. So mainly what we did again was to look at um, the, the, the zinc oxide nanoparticles and UV radiation by themselves. So here you have the UV radiation um, effects mainly on mortality, uh, no effects under hatching rate, and the, the tail malformation could also be perceived as one of the malformations most commonly seen under UV radiation. So then we had a look at uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles, and the more pronounced effects under the concentrations that we used were on the hatching rate. So while UV radiation had no effects on the hatching rate, the zinc oxide nanoparticles and mainly the effects on the hatching rate. So as you can see here, there were some uh, larvae that were enclosed inside the corium and were not hatching from the egg. So then when we combined uh, the, both UV radiation and uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles, we had to look at both um, endpoints because as in one case there was no effect uh, from, for the survival, like the UV radiation. Uh, the zinc oxide had some effect on the survival and hatching was something that was not really affected by, zinc by UV radiation, but it was by zinc oxide. So we had to look at both and to explore both uh, possibilities. So we treated the UV radiation as a concentration of a chemical, we did exactly the same procedure to calculate what would be the, the, the irradiation that should be used. And uh, we had a 96 hour exposure again, and we plotted the, the isobolograms for this uh, for this approach. And again, I will show you the same scheme to guide a little bit on what we had. So in the survival case, what we had was clearly a dose ratio uh, response. So as you can see here, uh, we have um, this bending in, in this area here, and this bending out in this area here. So this means that in this area, we will have high concentrations of zinc oxide, low UV radiation. So when we have high concentrations of zinc oxide and low radiation, we predict that there will be an increase in toxicity uh, higher than that that is predicted by looking at the individual um, toxicities of both stressors and uh, combining them together. On the other side, when we increase UV radiation and we had low concentrations of zinc oxide, what we really had was 
um, a decrease in toxicity. So it was kind of a protection of uh, zinc oxide towards UV radiation. Uh, when we look at uh, sorry, when we look at the etching, uh, something similar occurred, but on the other way around. So here, what we see is a uh, bending in at higher doses of UV radiation and the bending out at higher doses of zinc oxide. So here we will have uh, an impairment of etching, which is of course related with survival but in another uh, perspective, which is somehow a little bit tricky to interpret, uh, but uh, it's something different that occur within the life cycle at different stages of the life cycle of the egg, the egg development. So this is even uh, a worse prediction that if it was just straight in a, a straight line, but um, it's something that uh, needs to be further uh, approached when we are looking at these UV filters that are often used in sentence and um, other devices. So when we look at this uh, and we thought about what will be happening uh, while the embryos are exposed to UV light, and what are the, the mainly effects. We thought that this could be, or could have something to do with the bacterial community that usually is uh, present in the zebrafish embryos and that could be killed by the V radiation. So we just developed the similar study, but now looking at the bacterial community of zebrafish embryos um, looking at UV radiation, but other uh, chemicals. So what we did was exactly the same. We used the fish embryo development test. We had uh, three chemical compounds, so triclosan, uh, potassium dichromate and prochlorash. And mainly what we did is that we used um, chemical exposure only and radiation only and we could have uh, zero, so our negative control for the chemical exposure and the UV radiation, so the R0 is for radiation zero. And then we have two concentrations of the chemical, the 10 times lower a low egg and the low egg. So this is the, the chemical low and high concentration. And then we have also a low and high radiation level applied. And then we looked at the bacterial profile, uh, the community bacterial profile in the zebrafish embryos. So what we mainly see when, for instance, we combined triclosan with UV radiation was mainly that uh, looking at the PCOA um, analysis, uh, we, could be, we could see a discrimination between two groups. So we see here uh, the group that you can see here on the top described. So all the white uh, symbols are uh, tri triclosan zero, so no uh, chemical, and then uh, with some uh, radiation or with no radiation. And then when we increase the colors, so gray will be uh, low chemical and um, black will be high chemical. So as you can see here, the discrimination is mainly based on the, um, the level of the chemical present. So the triclosan was acting as a driver for discriminating the, the toxicity, the combined toxicity rather than the UV radiation. So we can have a combination here of low, high and zero radiation, but the high concentration of triclosan are all together joined in this group. So here we clearly see that triclosan is ru ruling the effects and changes on the bacterial community. Uh, then if we have a look here at the potassium dichloride um, effects, things change a little bit. So you have a, a group from, uh, again, no, no chemical, which is our control, also with some radiation, uh, usually low levels of radiation. And then you have together in one group, but still divided in two, the low uh, potassium 
uh, dichromate concentration and a high potassium dichromate concentration. And again, here we see that what is driving the most the bacterial community is the chemical and not the UV radiation. So uh, these uh, bring us to the, the conclusions, let's say, that uh, although uh, the, the zebrafish embryos bacterial communities were affected by UV radiation individually, triclosan, potassium dichlorate and prochlorage at concentrations that did not induce any effect in the epical ecotoxicological endpoints, we could see uh, straightly effects on their bacterial community. So there were some differences when we uh, looked at single and combined exposures, both on the structure of the zebrafish uh, biological community, uh, bacterial community, sorry, uh, but also on the richness and diversity that uh, somehow decreases uh, for, for instance, potassium dichromate. We also saw some interactive effects uh, in triclosan and UV radiation, although triclosan was the main driver for the changes in the bacterial uh, community. Uh, we also saw that uh, despite there were some modifications in the zebrafish, bacterial communities, there were some stress-tolerant bacterial groups that uh, were formed. So we also did some zebrafish cell lines. Uh, I will show you some preliminary results uh, from these zebrafish cell lines. Uh, we used uh, liver uh, zebrafish cell lines uh, and we exposed them to two um, pharmaceuticals to, to antineoplasmic uh, pharmaceuticals and we look at their mixtures and look at their cell morphology at, 20, at 72 hours of uh, exposure uh, and also their cell uh, viability. So here you can see an isovolagram. So as, you as I told you before, so these are preliminary results. And on the, the photographs on the, on the B set is the cell morphology that you can see. So mainly what we saw that was that um, when we increase the uh, concentration of um, doxorubicin in one concentration of terbectadine, there was no change in the toxicity. So you can see by these straight lines. For instance, if you have a concentration of 0.8 of terbectadine, if you start to increase the concentration of doxorubicin, the effects are the same. So this means that there is no interaction of the chemicals, but still they may be uh, doing some effects at different targets, and we cannot depict uh, an interaction between both of them. But of course, this has to be repeated, has to be changed and approach it in a different way so we can have both um, chemicals behaving uh, negatively towards the cell viability, uh, viability and also the cell uh, morphology. But it's something that we can also use uh, under these uh, cell lines approaches. So to finalize, I'll just like to resume a little bit what I present you here and uh, within an environmental perspective using zebrafish. So we can look at several exposure scenarios. I showed here chemical, chemical mixtures, chemical combined with um, climate changes, for instance, when we predict UV radiation to increase in the next years. And we can look at the perspective for human health here in the left side uh, and look at AOPs, for instance, or look at a more uh, ecological perspective and try to derive what will be the effects that can also occur in different species of fish, of freshwater fish. And uh, using this zebrafish model uh, under the One Health uh, approach, uh, that we can derive uh, even the AOPs or the ecological relevance for a human health and environmental scenario. 
and uh, look also at the mechanisms and the relevant effects from single and cumulative exposures, uh, looking at different climate areas, for instance, looking at different uh, climatic scenarios, extreme scenarios that can be used to predict combined toxicities. And I would like to thank you all uh, for attending this meeting and I would like to thank uh, all the people that contributed to this work. I will not uh, say here the names because there are a lot. Uh, and here are some of the projects that were behind the results obtained in this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. Thank you very, very much for this perfect presentation, Dr. Susana. And we have some questions for you. Uh, the first one, it's my time to have technical problems. <laughs> so, so I think that I can read it uh, as well, far as I, I know. Uh, I, I found them. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the first one is from Tom uh, from the University of Liege. And he's asking if you would recommend any tool or software to help with experimental design in testing mixture uh, mixture toxicity. And also, Ayrton Santana uh, made a complimentary question with this, this question from Tam, where he asks if there is a specific software to project your expected toxicity for Daniel Herio. Okay, well, uh, there may be some uh, software that can be developed for this, but mainly what we use in our daily life here at the lab is Excel. So uh, for the experimental design, what we'll transfer to the Excel is all the um, formulas that we use uh, to calculate the toxic units and then to transpose them to concentrations. Uh, so we don't make um, many mistakes while, while we are calculating the toxic units. And then also for um, the prediction of the mixture, we also use already provided Excel file with all the formulas from the models that has been developed by uh, Klaus Svensson at the CEH in the UK. And he provides it available to everyone that uh, wants to try it. So it's available. Uh, you just look for his webpage uh, and you can download it and it's free. Okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, Evish had a question also. Uh, do you think that in the future we can replace adult zebrafish with zebrafish cells for mixture compound testing? Um... It's a, well, it's a tricky question. So um, it depends on the objective. And of course that, for instance, if you don't know the mode of action of a certain chemical, you need to find the proper cell line to use. Because for instance, if it's um, a chemical that has its mode of action in one uh, type of cells and you are using another one, you won't see any effects. So then you cannot try to predict the effects. On the other side, if you have two chemicals acting in different cells, so they have different modes of action, well, you can have a 3D system with several cells together, but you have to build them. So you can do this approach. So maybe this is something for people that uh, know how to do this uh, systemic uh, cell lines, 3D cell lines or systems that can have several types of cell lines and can produce uh, a more efficient result if you want to test chemicals with different modes of action because you will need for sure different cell types at the same time to yes. test. Yeah, just like the, the, the human on a ship project, right? Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah, you need something like that. A, zebra fish in a ship. <laughs> yes, yes. So it, it, you will need to have this because if you are testing chemicals with the same mode of action, yes, you can easily use that. But 
if they have different modes of action, you will have to have a device uh, that will present you with uh, different targets so you can then uh, achieve your result. And the final question, I, I, it's mine, actually. <laughs> uh, thank you for this amazing speech. And have you ever uh, did some research using substances of abuse, such as cocaine, but in environmental concentrations using zebrafish? I'm asking you this because our lab is, is actually working with this right now. So no. That's true. <laughs> never. No, no, we, no, no, we, we, we never did that. Uh, well, we know that uh, some drugs, of course, they are very well described for their mode of action. So possibly you can, you can easily try to figure out uh, an experiment and try to, to predict what will be the mode of action and the conjunction and then see if that is true or not for the zebrafish. No, but yes. no we, we, we have well, never tried that. We, here in Rio de Janeiro, we found some, uh, some of, of them, some of these drugs, mainly cocaine and its metabolites, in environmental concentrations at river water. And yeah, we also have that I here, am. especially during yeah. the summer. Yes, and <laughs> uh, and, and uh, for instance, in the south of Portugal, in the summer, they have a peak of cocaine, caffeine, and uh, um, birth control pills. <laughs> so I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe this combination can provide some endocrine, neurotoxic, genotoxic okay. scenario for fish and for other uh, organisms, of course. Well, we, we received two more questions if we have time. <laughs> okay. uh, Renata is thanking you for this amazing talk and asking if it is, it, is it possible to use the FAT test to compare with adult results for mixtures? Yeah, well, that, that is the main aim of the fish embryo test. So um, generally the answer would be yes. But of course, there are always exceptions and also dependent on the, of the mode of action of the chemicals. So different life stages of every organism that changes their life traits during their uh, life cycle uh, will have different characteristics that will uh, make them have different exposure scenarios and different effects. For instance, we know that um, zebrafish embryos will be protected by their corium. So, and this will prevent the entrance of some uh, chemicals, which is not the case, for instance, for some chemicals that will be readily available for an adult zebrafish that will be um, ra rapidly exposed by their uh, gills, for instance, to the, to the chemical. So this is a little bit tricky, uh, but in the majority of the cases, this is uh, a good test to replace the adult. Uh, and uh, we are running through towards that because we want to decrease animal testing and the fish embryo test is not considered an animal test because the, the larvae are not feeding outside. So they are still feeding on uh, their energy reserves. So. Okay, and the last one is from Caroline. She's from the University Unicristus in Ceará, here in Brazil. Uh, excellent, excellent lecture, Dr. Susana. My question is whether the existing models are appropriate, for example, for for example, studying substances such as pesticides. Yes. So we have done a lot of uh, studies on pesticide mixtures, and is appropriated to any kind of chemical that you want to use, or even with the appropriate uh, approach, uh, even with temperature, for instance, uh, no, having in mind that when you increase the temperature, you have a similar approach for uh, chemicals, and then when you decrease, is the opposite. But with pesticides, we have worked them with them uh, very often, 
uh, and it works. It works with everything because all of the chemicals will have a mode of action, so it will work with everything. Got it. Uh, so th that's it. No more questions for for you. And so thank you very much for thank accepting you very much. the invitation and for this amazing, amazing talk. <laughs> uh, and so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. And and everybody will be right back at uh, in half an hour. This is our next guest, and we will send you the the new link to YouTube. So thank you for this morning, and we see you this afternoon. My name is Mark Francis. I'm the founder of Aquanerian. For the last 20 years, Aquanerian has built a team of dedicated professionals to support your research. Our mission is simple. Provide the highest performance zebrafish housing at a reasonable cost. Our team is here to allow you to focus on your research. We at Alesco work daily to create solutions and equipment for the scientific community, contributing to the advancement of Latin America biomedical research. Our mission is greater than just providing equipment. It is to provide security with a quality service and mainly with enormous respect and attention. For this reason, we invest in high technology and seek to maintain long-lasting relationships. Our commitment is to be a reliable partner that understands the needs, the reality, and the conditions of each customer to always offer the best solution. We understand the benefits of scientific research for humanity, and this encourages us. If today we have a better quality of life, greater longevity, if we beat cancer or use a medicine for a headache, it is because the advance of biomedical research allows us to. We trust in the work of researchers, in science, and the scientific community and we pride ourselves on doing our part. Just like you, we are passionate. Science is what moves us, because for Alesco, research is for life. Welcome everyone to FST's presentation. We appreciate you taking the time today and look forward to helping you find the right tools for the right application and your endless discoveries and research. Find Science Tools has been in business for over 45 years, providing scientists, researchers, and other life science professionals with high quality surgical instruments utilizing German steel and German craftsmanship with a secondary quality control inspection in our Heidelberg office. As we say, we only carry the best and offer a multitude of fine microsurgical instruments like spring scissors, forceps and rongeurs, but also a variety of options for wound closures and animal identification. In addition to our three FST offices, we have over 50 distributors worldwide. While the majority of the audience is based in the USA, Please note that we can ship anywhere in the world and any products not listed in our physical catalog or online at findscience.com can be sourced as a special order and we will work with you to get you what you need. Before we start, for those who are unfamiliar with FST, let me go over our core values we hold ourselves to and strive to provide to our customers. Quality. Impeccable product quality is what differentiates FST from the others. Secondly, our customer support. We strive for 100% customer satisfaction. Lastly. Our QC department in Germany upholds our manufacturers to the standards FST and our customers expect with every instrument. 